If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. When it comes to demonic powers, the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause... God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Here's the front page of one of our Christian Answers newsletters. I wrote the article, which is a collation of key points of biblical information. Now notice the first point here. It says unlimited sovereignty of God. God cannot be defeated. He rules and controls everything and everyone. And your scripture references are right there. Freeze frame it if you'd like to look those up. Now, in the middle column on the same page, notice this. Satan and evil spirits carry out God's plan. This is key. Satan and his legions knowingly or unknowingly accomplish God's plans. And, of course, your scripture references are right there. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 3 says, You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to find out if you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. God is allowing false prophets, Satan, and demons to test people to see if they will follow God or reject the Almighty. See also 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Don't fail the test. This is a little introduction to the speakers for this particular video. Right here, you can see me, Larry Wessels, who's speaking at the moment, when I was one year old in 1958, having a ball. Here's my brother, newly born, and I'm sitting right next to him in front of my mom's parents' house in Columbus, Texas, in 1958. And here I am, a little bit older, in elementary school. Somewhere around third grade or so, I got glasses. And so I've had glasses for most of my life. And then later, I played football. There I am, number 36. And I mainly played on the defense defensive back, linebacker, although now and then they put me on the offensive line and uh, I would get annihilated by much bigger guys. All right, here's a picture of me in college back in the 1970s, early 80s. There you can see me with those classic uh, aviator glasses from back then during that time. Okay, this is my brother Gary, circa... 1959, he's about a one-year-old, or a little bit less than that, perhaps. But uh, he likewise was having a ball when I was about his age back then. There he is, getting older. Here's a family shot with my dad, my mom. I'm standing there behind my dad, and then my brother Gary next to me. Here's a picture with my mother many years later. This is at a wedding, my aunt's wedding, my mom's sister, Marilyn got married and this is at the reception and 
I'm there next to my mother, and uh, there's my brother on the other side enjoying the wedding cake. Now, this is my dad in 1936 when he was two years old. Apparently back then, uh, young kids had their hair grow out. There's my dad in 1952, right after he graduated from Schulenburg High School out there. In case people don't know where Schulenburg is in Texas, it's not too far from Weimar, Texas, and not too far from Columbus, Texas. So that should help you know where that is. And there's my dad during his college days at the University of Texas. Here's a shot of my dad when he was dating my mom back in the mid-1950s. Here's a picture of all three of us, the main speakers in this particular video. Larry Wessel's on the left, my brother Gary in the middle, and my dad, Lloyd Wessel's, on the right, out on my dad's ranch outside of LaGrange, Texas, out there in the woods. And you see a scripture reference there coming from Luke 22:36, And it says, and Jesus is talking here, and it says, And he said to them, Quote, but now, whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag, and whoever has no sword is to sell his coat and buy one. End quote. So Jesus, right there in Luke twenty two thirty six, was already commanding his followers to uh, engage in self-defense. And one thing you know when you're out in the woods, that there's a lot of critters out there that may do you harm, so it's always good to <laughs> protect yourself against those critters. Now, it's just interesting to note that uh, I've featured my dad in a previous video, and you can see it there on YouTube. The video is called, Both Fake Christians and Pagans Deny the Bible and Jesus Alike, Since Jesus Said, Holy Scripture is True. And of course, the title in the video itself on YouTube is called, The Inspiration of Scripture, the Bible is the Word of God because Jesus said so. And here in this particular video, I featured my dad shooting a snake we found inside our camp house out there at the ranch. An analogy. Back in the late 1970s, I was with my dad out on his property out in the country outside of LaGrange, Texas. I was in our camp house and I stepped into the garage where I was met by an unhappy snake who was ready to strike. My dad told me to push the snake out on the gravel driveway where he would dispatch the snake with his single shot 22 rifle that my grandfather had given him back in the 1940s on his 14th birthday. Once I got the snake outside on the gravel driveway, the snake was completely exposed. Being exposed is not what a snake likes and it took off slithering as fast as it could go to get away and hide once more. However, my dad, armed with his trusty one-shot rifle that he had known so well for over 30 years at that time, took care of the snake with the one bullet he had with a direct hit right to the snake's head. I've always been proud of my dad for that shot. I'm telling this old story as an analogy to a much older story as found in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, verses 3 through 15. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, but you shall bruise him on the heel. Now notice when it says, he shall bruise you on the head. Down there in the footnotes, as we see, for Genesis 3.15, it can also be considered the word crush. So he shall crush you on the head. This is all coming from a New American Standard Bible in this citation. Remember, the way to shoot the head off the devil and his multitude of lies is with the sure word of God. In Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, Jesus defeated the devil three separate times by rebuking the devil with the word of God. Jesus said, quote, it is written in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. Jesus said, and he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God.
Jesus responded to the devil's second temptation. Jesus responded again, it is written, Matthew chapter 4, verse 7. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And on the devil's final temptation in this section of scripture, Jesus rebuked the devil a third time in Matthew chapter 4, verse 10, saying, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. That's a reference from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Greetings and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels. I want to thank you for being with us today. This is going to be a kind of a very different presentation that we're doing here for Christian Answers in that I've got my own family here with me to do this presentation. It's kind of interesting. This is my dad, Lloyd Wessels. Good to see you, Dad. All right. I've known Dad all my life. And, and here's my brother, Gary. So... About the same with him, so. <laughs> Although he is my younger brother, not quite all my life, but pretty close. Pretty so, close. Pretty close. So anyway, I, to, to, to set this up, the reason we're doing this is, you know, many of my YouTube subscribers realize that I've got a whole playlist on the occult, black magic, Satan, all that kind of stuff. Things that go bump in the dark. Somewhere around 20 videos, and I always thought the particular story that we're about to relate was on one of my videos. It's called a cult seminar. That video has over 250,000 views. And uh, so I thought it was there the whole time. And then I had someone that I'm a, that I work with what, listen to it all. You know, it's a, like a two, two and a half hour video, but they listened to the whole thing and they said, well, I've never heard that story and I was listening to it just to hear that story. And uh, I said, wow, I, th I thought it was there. So to make sure I've got it on tape, we're going to tell a little ghost story here. And then, by the way, I, we do have a, a newsletter on this type of thing. This newsletter by our ministry is called Are Psychic Mediums Communicating with Ghosts and Demonic Spirits? And of course, there's a lot of information in here. What is interesting is uh, on one on page seven of this newsletter, I actually visited one of those so-called haunted houses over there in Louisiana one time. Uh, but anyway, get the newsletter to get more information from this. I'll have a lot of good Bible information about these types of things. As the cut line to our photo in our newsletter states, Christian Answers Director Larry Wessels with Bill Jamard, mayor of Ville Platte, Louisiana, on the porch of a supposedly famous haunted house in Lafayette, Louisiana. Larry had come to attend the graduation of his niece and was invited to see a haunted house. The skeptical Wessels saw a black cat, but no ghosts, and concluded that haunted house designations are useful legends for the locals to attract curious tourists. Now, looking on the back side of the newsletter, I actually have some full pictures here of the so-called haunted house. And the cut line here, photo of a famous haunted house in Lafayette, Louisiana. The story goes, as told by the internet and elsewhere, that in this particular house roams a ghost named Amelie, wearing a rose-colored dress. She is said to turn the lights on and off rattle pots in the pantry, and sometimes set off the burglar alarm. And below that is another view of this alleged Louisiana haunted house. Now, reading some of the material written by Ron Rhodes in our newsletter, page 7 of our newsletter, dead humans are not ghosts. Another reason we know that genuine encounters with spirits involve demons and not dead humans is this. The Bible indicates that dead humans are not even available for earth visits as ghosts. At death, the believer's spirit departs from the physical body and immediately goes into the presence of the Lord in heaven. That's found in Philippians chapter 1, verses 21 through 23. This is why when Stephen, 
was being put to death by stoning, he prayed, quote, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, end quote. Acts chapter 7, verse 59. At the moment of death, the spirit returns to God who gave it. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7. In 2 Corinthians 5, 8, we learn that Christians who were away from the body are, quote, at home with the Lord, end quote. The Greek word pros used for with in the phrase at home with the Lord. This word suggests very close face-to-face -face fellowship. It is a word used of intimate relationships. The verse thereby indicates that the fellowship we will have with Christ immediately following physical death will be very intimate. Don't miss this point. Christians who have died are not still on earth, but are with the Lord in heaven, where they remain in intimate, perpetual fellowship with Him. For unbelievers, death holds grim prospects. At death, the unbeliever's spirit does not go to heaven, but is involuntarily confined to a place of great suffering. Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Second Peter 2 Peter 2.9 tells us that the Lord knows how, quote, to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment, end quote. The unrighteous are not still on earth, nor do they have access to earth. Whatever people are encountering at alleged haunted houses and hotels is most certainly not the spirits of dead people walking around. As I have shown, the biblical evidence suggests that if a person is encountering any spirit entity at all, for example, through occult practices, it is a demonic spirit. Now, one last thing I'll read here from this newsletter is from page five by Ron Rhodes. And he states here, the truth about ghosts and hauntings. Many today are convinced by the evidence for ghostly phenomena. That is, they believe dead human beings make appearances among us. Many books provide evidence for these appearances. However, we need to remember something that Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, besides Jesus, of course, uh, 1 Kings 3.12, chapter 4, verse 29 through 32, chapter 5, verse 12, chapter 10, verse 23, said on one occasion, quote, The first to present his case seems right, till another comes forward and questions him, end quote, Proverbs 18, 17. The case for dead humans appearing among us may seem strong to some until further evidence pokes holes in the theory. Many verses in Scripture encourage Christians to exercise wisdom and discernment so they will not be deceived. Proverbs 3.21 exhorts, My son, preserve sound judgment and discernment. Do not let them out of your sight. Ephesians 4.14 urges us to no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in the deceitful scheming. In other words, don't believe everything you hear. 1 Timothy 4.7 warns, have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Zechariah 8.16 instructs us to Speak the truth to each other. For further reference, if people want to get this newsletter by Dr. Ron Rhodes, president of Reasoning from the Scriptures Ministries, he's the author of numerous books and holds THM and THD degrees from Dallas Theological Seminary, called Are Psychic Mediums Communicating with Ghosts or Demonic Spirits? You can simply go to our website, www.biblequery.org. And once there, on the main homepage, look up to the upper left-hand corner of the homepage and click on the menu icon. Once you click on the menu icon, that will then bring up a selection of resources to choose from. Click the newsletter section. And once there, you can select the newsletter concerning this issue, which is volume six, number three. Now, to relate this particular story, uh, and I'm only doing it for this co-worker and some other people have asked me about it, and finally have it in video form where people across the world can watch this. Uh, I've got three witnesses to the same story on, a, on 
but can only be called a haunted house. <laughs> and uh, what this is, is uh, I guess this was back around, what do you think, 1968, 67, yeah, uh, something like that. Yeah. Dad, that night, you and Mom went dancing, I think. We were we in Schulenburg. We went down somewhere. I don't remember where anymore. Yeah. But 1968 was a long time. <laughs> we left y'all there because y'all were old enough to be by right. yourself. Right, right, right. And uh, this is in the Schulenberg house. Yes, yeah, Schulenberg. That's the house you grew up in. Yes, right. Uh, that house, I think, was built in two. Uh, part of it was built in 1934, and the other no, was built in 1937, 1940, and then 1950. Oh, it had three, 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 stages. three stages to it. Right? Yes. I always wondered why it sort of looked the way it looked. Yes, three stages. I, you know, and well, one thing that always struck me about that house out there in Schulenberg. And when we edit this video, they'll get to see what that house looks like. But uh, it, 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 there was all these strange noises going on in that house. Right. Like on a continuum. Is there anything, you can, before we talk about the main story that relates to all three of us, uh, you growing up in that house, was there anything strange about the house? Or were there any funny no. noises or things like that? No, I mean, I always had some noises downstairs and... Uh, Seemed like in the garage, and then there was a little room that my dad started business in that was... That was under the staircase, wasn't yeah, it? Well, a room to the side of it. I well, remember that. Yeah, it was, yeah, side, yeah, yeah, it was yeah. right as you came in the front door. That's right. Went straight ahead. I remember like it was yesterday. And, and it was uh, just a storage room after he moved his business in the bigger part that he built in 1940. Mm -hmm. Anyway... Uh, all those areas down there seemed like at different times had popping noises downstairs or strange noises that I, you know, and I'd go down there thinking, well, something's down here, maybe some animal or something's running around and go down there and didn't see anything. And it would quit when I got down there. It always stopped. The popping every time you walk near it, <laughs> every time <laughs> it was, you, know, you could you could never find the source. Yeah, and you know what's funny is, uh, back when we were growing up, and we went out to the Schulenberg house on the weekends. It seemed mm -hmm. like almost every weekend, and mom, you, and Gary would sleep on one side of that house, and I was in your old room. Mm -hmm. On the far side of the house, yeah. staircases in the middle. Y'all are way on that side. I'm way over here by myself. And I used to, sometimes I had trouble getting to sleep. And especially some of those ghost stories you used to tell me from Edgar <laughs> Allan Poe. That didn't help. <laughs> and the monkey's paw. I remember you, I couldn't even get to bed that night after you told me that one. Uh, but, uh, but when I'd be in your old room, that... That closet you had right there is like sometimes I would look at that thing and I'm all by myself on this side of the house. There's kind of no weird noises here and there. And, and I kept thinking something was going to goblin or something's going to come out of that closet at me. You know, yeah, we had that problem. <laughs> yeah, but, well, you didn't, you weren't telling yourself these ghost stories like you were telling me back then. Uh, but <laughs> uh, so anyway. Uh, well, we left you all there by yourselves and then when we came back, Y'all were out in the yard. Uh, Y'all wasn't even in the house. You wouldn't go in the house until we got back. <laughs> yeah, we couldn't figure out what was going on. Until you, <laughs> you go on and say what you did. Okay, I'll, I'll set it up and then we'll bring you back to Dad where he found us out there. Okay, so uh, Dad and Mom go off to go dancing, have a little date, and leave us behind. To, and so we're down in Grandpa's old office downstairs. Uh, on one side of the house there and uh we got that old tv set down there black and white i think it was or something like that and we're just killing time watching an old movie zulu uh you know where that those british soldiers being attacked by all the and you know it's a it's a big time war movie there's a lot of action and yelling and screaming and shooting and a lot of noise like that and so we're we're watching this old movie down there and uh all of a sudden uh while that's going on despite all the noise coming from the, the war movie i thought i heard something that sounded like footsteps coming down the, the staircase
and, and in Grandpa's old room downstairs, there was a door that shut, uh, and on the other side of the door, it led right to that staircase into that storage uh, thing that Dad was just talking about. Uh, and I could have sworn I heard door footsteps coming down those those things. So I go over there, and the, I don't think the door was shut at that point. And I said. I don't even know if I mentioned to you on that first time, but uh, I, I I go and I thought I heard some footsteps in the staircase, and so I, I walked over there and I looked out the door up the stairs. It was kind of dark up there, but I didn't see anything, and all of a sudden I didn't hear any noise anymore. Right, <laughs> and uh, I said, "Man, I could have sworn I heard footsteps coming down the stairs. That's kind of that's kind of spooky, you know." So I shut the door. <laughs> Shut the door, <laughs> and uh, and uh, we go back to watching the movie, right? right? And I think the second time, that's when you might have heard something yourself, perhaps, or might have been the third time. I know I was hearing it all along. I actually heard it quite often. And, okay. Uh, so okay. I remember constant footsteps, and it was coming down the stairs, <laughs> and it was. You could hear it coming yeah. down the stairs, it just was bump, bump. Boom. And it was, like it's getting closer. It was in sync. It was like a rhythm. It yeah. wasn't just random pops or anything. It right. was in rhythm. And uh, so, and it sounded like footsteps and uh, so coming the, down the stairs. And then the second time, you know, this time I looked through the, because that door had a window on it uh, that from Grandpa's office to the staircase. So this time I'm looking through the window up there. But when I got over the window and looked up, all of a sudden, nothing. No sound, no anything. Right. And I remember going, look, we're both hearing this stuff, man. And then I got a chair in Grandpa's thing, and I put it underneath the doorknob. You know, I heard <laughs> <laughs> the chair there. I said, this, this is a little freaky here. And I said, well, uh, but it stopped, and I didn't see anything, so let's go back to watching the movie. Yeah. You know? And so we were watching that Zulu movie. It was yeah. our imagination or something, you know. Right, like, right. What is this? Right. Uh, and then what happens next? Well, you hear it again. <laughs> and... Here it comes, stomping down the stairs. That's right. And then louder and louder and louder. And it's like it's getting closer. Like it's, uh, yeah, it's like at the top of the staircase, and you can hear it getting closer and closer coming down the staircase. I mean, it was that real. And we're both hearing it. And uh, it was either the third or fourth time. Yeah, I don't know. We lost our courage. Yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it. Because every time I went to the window to check it out, it would stop. Right. And I wouldn't see anything, and I was too frightened by the third or fourth time to even open the door to look out, you know. <laughs> it and was so loud that I expected somebody to come through that door. That's right. Even though I had that chair wedged under there, you know. I started to think about putting other furniture over there. <laughs> right. Well, in Grandpa's room, he had a screen door that led out to the front yard. You know, his other door on the other side led out to the garage. So you got the garage here. The, the screen door leading straight out to the front yard, and then this door to the staircase. Yeah. And it was that third or fourth time that we just freaked out. <laughs> we didn't know what it was. It's basically what I call a spook house. Yeah. And uh, I don't know what it was, but uh, I had enough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I just, Let's get out of here. <laughs> so we went flying out that front screen door to the front yard. You know, with the tarantulas crawling around, you always had tarantulas. You know, those are, you, you know, you can't have a spook house without tarantulas. You know, right. the, the lightning bugs and everything else. So it, we just go run as fast as we can. And that was a big lot too. Big that, house. That, that house in the lot was huge. A lot of pecan trees we used to supply the the local grocers with pecans. So those huge hundred year old trees or whatever. You know. Anyway, we're running. Uh, up to the main road right there in front of that street. What was that street there? That was just a Summit, Summit Street. They call Summit it. Street, and it led right into downtown Schulenburg. Uh, so, and the rail was, the train rail was down ways. You used to hear the trains going by all the time. But anyway, we, we beelined it straight to downtown Schulenburg, down <laughs> Summit Street. We just, when we got far enough away from the house, we started just walking. You know, we, you know, it's like, yeah. okay, we're far enough from that house. Yeah. We're comfortable. We, yeah, we're comfortable. Let's just walk into town. But this by this time, it was probably around 11 at night or midnight. Late, it, was, it was late. In a small town like that, Schulenburg, 
I mean, I expected to see somebody or somebody around in the downtown part of town. So we, 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 did we ever see anybody? I don't remember seeing anybody. I don't recall. Don't yeah, I mean, we walked around. Uh, everything was closed. And, you know, there's some street lights on and stuff. But it's like, man, there's just nobody around, nobody to talk to. Uh, we're just kind of wandering around in downtown Schulenburg. And then we finally go... Well, I guess we have to go back. Yep. <laughs> I guess we have to go back. We can't do it. There's nobody here. And, and we're, we're just wandering around in the middle of the night. So let's just go back and hopefully dad and mom will be back and and we can get our courage to go back in the house. Right? Yep. And so uh, so we did. And I guess we weren't back in the yard. I stand outside the house that long before dad and mom right. come pulling up. Right. And now this takes us back to you, dad. You see us. Yeah. Out there in the yard. Yeah, I wondered what in the world were y'all doing out in the middle of the night in the yard, you know. And that's when y'all told me about all this stuff. And I said, well, that's not unusual. I mean, I, <laughs> it's not unusual. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I've always heard pops and stuff down. down. Yeah, but you investigated when you were growing up there and all yeah, that stuff. And, but it always disappear when you would yeah, go check well, it out. <laughs> Mainly after my parents were gone, and uh -huh. you know I was coming out there by myself or something. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, you'd hear noises. Uh -huh. This is just a uh, voiceover interjection to react a little bit more to what Dad is saying there, and of course uh, Gary corroborated this himself. Particularly after we finished videotaping this scene at the farmhouse out there uh, on my dad's birthday, on his 84th birthday, when this interview was done with my, my dad and my brother. But as you see here, it didn't even seem to phase dad that these strange occurrences were occurring, uh, particularly about the staircase and everything. And he talked about how he would hear all kinds of noises and particularly popping, popping sounds. Now, I, that did take me by surprise. And I wish at the time I was actually interviewing my dad and my brother, I had had elaborated more on asking them about what they particularly heard. Now, what was interesting, after we finished filming and we were getting ready to head back into the other room where all the rest of the family was for the, my dad's birthday party, Gary, as we're getting ready to leave there, that room to go, he mentioned to me about the popping sounds. And I wanted to videotape him saying that, but he said, ah, let's just go back in to do the party. But he had taken a few minutes to tell me about it. And... He said that he'd be in the house and he would hear these popping sounds. Now, like I said, I've never heard those myself. And when Dad mentioned it, I was kind of surprised because I don't remember hearing any popping sounds in my own personal experience. Now, I heard all kinds of other strange sounds on a regular basis, but not this popping sound he was talking about. But Gary told me that several different times, because we went out to that house, you know, year in, year out, on the weekends mainly, but Gary tells me that he would hear those popping sounds coming from downstairs, but it sounded like they were coming from the storage closet underneath the staircase. And so he would hear it while he was upstairs. And so he would come down the stairs still hearing the popping sounds. And he would go to the base of the staircase, and that's where the door leading into the storage closet underneath the staircase was. And he'd be hearing these noises, these popping sounds. And he told me that he'd open the door, and all of a sudden, all the noises and everything would just stop. As he described to me, he would stand there looking into that storage closet under the staircase and just kind of fold his arms and just stand there for several minutes, waiting to hear some more popping sounds like he was hearing so much when he was upstairs. And this is what my dad referenced to as well. And he would just stand there for a while, waiting to hear something, but nothing. It would just stop. And then he'd just go, huh. And, and then he would just, you know, shut the door and then head back off to wherever, either upstairs or wherever he wanted to go. And so... That was a new one for me. I learned that at the time I was doing the, uh, the interview. We were always hearing noises and things, but that was a new story for me uh, that day, hearing that about the popping sounds from both my dad and my brother. Now, this takes me into something else, and I want to bring this up at the moment. Haunted houses, poltergeists, things of this nature. Years ago, because I am a Christian apologist, and my ministry has been basically to study all the false prophets, the false religions, and the occult to have a good 
biblical Christian understanding of these these things. And so I used to go to half price books and look for old books and things that had to do with either the cults like old Jehovah's Witness books or Mormon books or whatever it might be that could help me in my research to study all these groups, get into their history and so forth. Well, while I was down at the half price books uh, one time, this is way back in the 1980s, I, uh, I found uh, a complete set and you can see it here, uh, the Encyclopedia of Occultism in Parapsychology. You see here you have volume one, A through L, and then of course volume two. And here it says, a compendium of information on the occult sciences, magic, demonology, superstitions, spiritism, mysticism, metaphysics, psychical science, and parapsychology. As you can see on this page, this says over 2,500 entries, completely cross-referenced in biographical and biographical notes, edited by Leslie A. Shepard. And looking on the inside of the book, uh, here, basically in the contents page, we find that uh, you have all kinds of subjects covered in this, in this, this volume. Indexes on animals, birds, insects, demons, gems, geographical places of phenomenon, gods, paranormal phenomenon. And then as I'm not going to read all this, but you can, you can see from the list there and you can freeze frame your YouTube video to read it for yourself. All the different topics here, you, you notice here, they have at number 21, you got hauntings. And as we continue through what's in this volume, you see particularly number 33 there, poltergeist. And I think that's what we have going on here. We have basically a haunted house with manifestations of a poltergeist and so forth. But you can rephrase that to see what you can see. But now just to go into the book itself here in volume one, page 412. This book is not a Christian book. These are written by researchers and spiritualists and people that are not biblically based. But this is just from their perspective. Now look on the subject of haunting. Here's what they say disturbances of a supernormal character attributed to the spirits of the dead. Tradition established two main factors in haunting, an old house and restlessness of a spirit. The first represents an unbroken link with the past. The second is believed to be caused by remorse over an evil life or by the shock of violent death. The manifestations vary greatly. In most cases, strange noises are heard alone, auditory effects. In some cases, objects are displaced, lights are seen, visual effects. A chillingness is felt in the atmosphere, not infrequently unbearable stench pervades the room. An evil influence imparts feelings of unspeakable horror, sensory effects, and phantoms, both men and animals, appear in various degrees of solidity. The more noise they make, the less solid they are. The phenomenon are often classed as objective and subjective. This classification is rather arbitrary as it does not take account of auditive hyperesthesia. Sounds below ordinary limit of audition may be objectively heard, though nobody else is aware of a beginning disturbance. The phantoms themselves are, in most cases, harmless and aimless. Quote, since the days of ancient Egypt, ghosts have learned and have forgotten nothing. End quote. That comes from Andrew Lang, who apparently is an expert on this. The usual type display no intelligence, appear irregularly, and act like a sleepwalker. Now, that's their definition of a haunting in this occultic encyclopedia. Another thing I'd like to bring up here is about what this encyclopedia says about poltergeists, which is what I think manifested itself to us, my dad, my brother, my uh, uh, self, and of course my mother, but my mother's passed on, so she's not around to testify to anything. But anyway, here's what it says on page 718 of volume two. M to Z under poltergeist, 
of this occultic encyclopedia. It says, the name given to the supposed supernatural causes of outbreaks of rappings, inexplicable noises, and similar disturbances, which from time to time have mystified men of science as well as the general public. The term, i.e., poltergeist, rattling ghost, is sufficiently indicative of the character of these beings whose manifestations are, at the best, puerile and purposeless tricks and not infrequently display an openly mischievous and destructive tendency. The poltergeist is by no means indigenous to any one country, nor has he confined his attentions to any particular period. Lang mentions several cases belonging to the Middle Ages, and one at least which dates so far back as 856 B.C. In both savage and civilized countries, this particular form of haunting is well known, and it is a curious fact that the phenomenon are almost identical in every case. The disturbances are always observed to be particularly active in the neighborhood of one person, generally a child or a young woman, and preferably an epileptic or hysterical subject. According to the theory advanced by spiritualists, the center of the disturbances is a natural medium through whom the spirits desire to communicate with the world of living beings. In earlier times, such a person was regarded as a witch or the victim of a witch, whichever supposition was best fitted to the circumstances. The poltergeist is represented as a development from witchcraft and the direct forerunner of modern spiritualism and is, in fact, a link between the two. Now, for those viewing this video, you'll see on your screen the rest of the article here about the poltergeist. You've got page 718, followed by page 719, and continuing through to 720, 721, and then 722. So if you want to freeze frame each page and see what the occultic encyclopedia goes on about the poltergeist, there's just all kinds of detailed information here. But I'm just giving you the point of view from people who do not believe the Bible, don't go with the Word of God, but they're just going with the phenomenon that they've experienced or observed and with the historical background in place. Okay, another thing I like to mention is maybe a very famous person that many people have already heard of. But as you can see on your screen here, now this is just simply coming from Wikipedia. Who was Carl Jung? Now people have heard of Sigmund Freud, and usually almost in the same breath you hear about Carl Jung. These guys, well let me just read what it says here. It says here, Carl Gustav Jung was a Swiss psychiatrist, and psychoanalyst who founded analytical psychology. His work has been influential not only in psychiatry, but also in anthropology, archaeology, literature, philosophy, and religious studies. As a notable research scientist based at the famous Berkholzli Hospital under Eugen Bueller, he came to the attention of the Viennese founder of psychoanalysis, Sigmund Freud. The two men conducted a lengthy correspondence and collaborated on an initially joint vision of human psychology. Freud saw in the younger man the potential heir he had been seeking to carry on his new science of psychoanalysis. I'm not going to read all this, but you can see these two guys were very influential in this whole so-called science of psychoanalysis. And you get all these head doctors and psychiatrists and stuff. A lot of what they teach and believe is based on these two guys. What's interesting here, I did a little extra research on the internet so anyone at home watching this video can see this for yourself. But there's an article called Halloween Special, C.G. Young's, that's Carl Gustav Young's Spine Chilling Nights in a quote, haunted house, end quote. Now, this guy gets a lot of respect from the scientific community. 
And what we see here, and I'm just reading from the article that anyone can find on the on the internet. You see a picture there of Fannie Moser, but underneath that, the following excerpts are from a report originally contributed by Carl Gustav Jung to Spuck, and then it's got a German name there. I'm not going to try to <laughs> get my bad articulation of that, but you can see it there for yourself. From Chapter 5, Baden, GYR, 1950. A study of hauntings and poltergeist cases by the zoologist Fanny Mosier, 1872 to 1953. The below is extracted from Jung's Psychology and the Occult. That's from London, Routledge, 1982, pages 174 to 183. I'm grateful to, and he mentions names here and so forth, and can be read as a footnote to my previous post. And, and the information is all there. But now, as we get into this, we start reading, there's a picture of Carl Gustav Jung in his older days. He's given a report about what went on in this house he was in. And uh, I'm not going to read it all there. So once again, just freeze frame your screen and you can read it for yourself what he's saying. He, he's describing a smell there on this first page. And then as we move on through it, the next page, you can read it for yourself by free framing of your screen. But I'm going to just hit some of the highlights here. Go on to the next page and just mainly what's highlighted the most. He says here in the middle of the page, something brushed along the walls, the furniture creaked. Now here and now there, there were rustlings in the corners, he says. And then a little bit down the page, he says, I thought I must have noises in my ear, but at three o'clock in the morning, they stopped as promptly as before. The next evening, I tried my luck again with a bottle of beer. And then as you go on to the next page, he, he starts describing all this stuff. And then he says here, and you can see it in, in bold print, there were loud knocking noises. And I had the impression that an animal about the size of a dog was rushing around the room in a panic. And he continues to describe all this phenomenon. And then down below in bold print, says, sounds of knocking came also from outside in the form of dull blows, as though somebody were banging on the brick walls with a muffled hammer. And he talks about the sounds of the knocking and things of that nature. And then we go to the next page, banging and so forth. But freeze frame it if you want to read his whole story here. I don't have time to read it all. Going on to the next page, Carl Jung says, I had the feeling there was something near me and opened my eyes. There beside me on the pillow, I saw the head of an old woman and the right eye wide open glared at me. The left half of the face was missing below the eye. And then he talks about the fifth weekend was so unbearable, I asked my host to give me another room. <laughs> so he's actually hanging out in this place and he's describing all the phenomena that he's seen in this place, this haunted house. And going on the next page, we see he said he heard again footsteps which stopped just in front of the door. The, the chair creaked as though somebody was pushing it against the door from the other side. And, you know, just, just page after page of this stuff coming from Carl Jung, who's a highly respected scientist in the community, especially in psychoanalysis and, and all these things we already described about it. Because so here's someone that's in the world of psychology is highly regarded. And he's giving these stories himself of his own experiences. And then as you see on this page, you see Carl Jung's red book, Science or Revelation. And you have here more information. Once again, it's too much for me to read in this particular video, but you'll just see scans of this stuff here and you can freeze frame uh, the pages so you can read it off the video or if you want to, you can actually go look up this on the internet where I found it, just like anyone can, and read this information for yourself coming from this highly respected psychoanalyst. And so here's all the different pages. I'm just kind of turning the pages as I go because I'm not going to read it, but I'm giving time for you to, for us to flip through the pages as it goes. So there's Carl Jung. And now one last thing I'll say about him. When you go to this Encyclopedia of Occultism and Parapsychology, and this is found in Volume 1, A through L, which we've already referenced to. What do we find here on page 
486. Well, we find an entry about Carl Gustav Jung, right there, 1875 to 1961. Swiss psychologist who made various occult ideas of valid study within the framework of psychology. Born July 26, 1875 at Keswell Thurgau, Switzerland. He studied medicine at the University of Basel, Switzerland, 1895 through 1900, and took his MD in 1902, University of Zurich. While still a student, he read various works on occultism and attended spiritualistic seances. Now, I wanted to emphasize this right here. While still a student, he read various works on occultism and attended spiritualistic seances. Now, from Christian understanding, seances are a direct way of communicating with spirits. And from the Christian understanding, the demons. Now, it's interesting in this book, which is not written by Christians, you find a section here about demonology on page 226 of this encyclopedia. And just to read a, a brief section from it, it says, that branch of magic which deals with malevolent spirits. In religious science, it has come to indicate knowledge regarding supernatural beings who are not deities, but it is in regard to the magical significance only that it falls to be dealt with here. The Greek term daemon originally indicated genius or spirit, but in England, it has come to mean a being actively malevolent. Ancient demonology will be found dealt with in the articles Egypt, Semites, Genius, and Devil Worship, and Savage Demonology under the heads of the various countries and races where it had its origin. And then it goes on from there. Anyway, I just wanted to emphasize the fact that Carl Jung himself was involved in spiritualistic seances, which, from a biblical point of view, is nothing more than communication with demonic spirits, which we'll get into more in this video presentation. And, it, and it's talking about his experiences here. And it ties back into what I just read you. And once again, you can freeze frame uh, your screen and read it right off the screen if you like. It goes from page 486 to a little bit over to page... 487. So this is well documented. I'm not making this up. This is all coming from this, this guy that have such high scientific regard for. So it's not like you take him, you take him to all these other accounts, go to the internet, and you can see for yourself all kinds of incidences of haunted houses recorded by who knows how many people everywhere. And there's all kinds of listings on the internet of famous haunted houses. I already showed how I went to a famous haunted house supposedly in uh, Louisiana with the mayor, as you saw already. And, and there's all these other accounts. They're just everywhere. So anyway, I'm just putting this in to show you this. This kind of stuff is, is well documented. It's supernatural activity. And, of course, one thing about atheists and skeptics is they don't like to believe in anything supernatural because uh, they don't want to believe in God. They don't want to believe in the supernatural. So they, they just take that, well, everything's material. But, see, the real world isn't like what the atheists think. Uh, there's a lot that atheists don't know or don't understand, and they don't want to understand. So they're, they take the three-monkey approach. They don't want to see what's happening. They don't want to hear what's happening, and they don't want to talk about what's happening. But... This stuff is real, and it's what's really going on out there. Now, along these lines of haunted houses, many people out there may not realize that I, since 2007, I've also been a real estate agent. I actually got into real estate for the purpose of additional fundraising for our YouTube video ministry. I, I just hate asking people for money, so I just felt like since the Lord's given me all this energy, I'll just do that on the side to raise some money for us. Anyway, I've been doing all this real estate for all these years while I'm still working my main all-night job that many people know about. You can check out this video if you want to know my life at the, the post office. But anyway, I just wanted to say this, that in real estate, 
And of course there you can see my real estate card, some of my past listings. I've had a lot of them by God's grace. But uh, anyway, I'm not doing this to advertise my real estate business. It's mainly just to say that because I am a real estate agent, I have learned that even in the industry of real estate, they talk about haunted houses. Now you can see here in this article, and of course this is available online. That's simply what I did. I just <laughs> went on the internet and started looking up some of this stuff. It says here, caveat emptor, buyer beware. Does Texas, now of course I'm, I'm a real estate agent operating in Texas, does Texas require the disclosure of spooky details in real estate transactions? And this is an article by Amanda C. Brown. And then of course here you can see she's saying in a residential real estate market where most sellers agonize about interested buyers noticing outdated fixtures in the bathroom or patched areas of drywall, what should be done if the home harbors a more sinister secret? Do sellers have to divulge details of strange footsteps at night or doors that slam by themselves? Or that the current resident's child has developed a strange fascination with watching static on the flat screen and frequently recounts conversations with, quote, the TV people, end quote. What about other disturbing events on the property that might cause buyers to shy away, such as murders or even natural deaths? The answer is, as with many issues concerning Texas law, it depends. Now, I'm not going to read this whole article here, but viewers at home, as we scan these pages and put the information up there on the screen, you can freeze frame each page and then just read the information for yourself. But haunted houses and real estate are actually taken seriously. Now, you see here, Realtor Mag, and it says, Got Ghosts? How to Sell a Haunted House. And you've got information there. I mean, these are serious articles in the real estate world. Most people aren't even aware of this because, you know, they're not real estate agents and maybe they're not that concerned about it. But it's taken seriously in the real estate market. You can see other information here, Realtor Magazine online comment policy. You get information here about things like this, ghosts and, and whatnot. And in fact, they even teach this when you take your update classes, uh, continuing education courses. You see here, changes, nuances, and updates. Every two years as a real estate agent, you have to take these required classes so you can renew your license for another two years as an agent. But anyway, you also see here, just some typical ads on the internet. I, I simply just grab these by doing a real estate haunted houses search. Anyone can do this if you've got a computer. But you can look down here on this page. You say real haunted houses on sale. Hurry. Okay. Then you see in here seven real life haunted houses for sale. Zillow real estate. Five of the most haunted houses in the U.S. real estate. Zillow haunted houses for sale. How to sell a haunted house. Things like that. So it's, it's a fascinating situation that I couldn't resist bringing into this video for the simple fact that even the real estate industry around the country takes this seriously. In fact, uh, we have a video on UFO activity, which is tied into the occult. And for anyone that want more information on that, just put in the YouTube search box, UFOs and put our, either my name, Larry Wessels, or C Answers TV. That stands, of course, for Christian Answers TV. But C Answers TV next to UFOs in the YouTube search box and see our videos that we produce just on UFO activity, which surprisingly are very similar to the kind of activities you find in haunted houses associated with poltergeists, phony religion, and all that other stuff you find the same kind of paranormal, supernatural type activity related in both cases. And of course, my thesis is that uh, UFOs, the occult, ghosts, hauntings, poltergeists, and almost everything you can find in this encyclopedia of occultism and parapsychology, it's all related to the same source. Now, when you read the Bible, you find that there's God, the angels, the demons and people on the planet Earth. And all these things are interrelated. 
but we'll get into that more as we move through this video. Not only do UFOs and the occult use the same disciplines, such as levitation, teleportation of objects, psychokinesis, clairvoyance, automatic writing, and telepathy, but their theologies are completely foreign to biblical Christianity. UFO theologies include everything from reincarnation and evolution to man achieving cosmic godhood, but they do not include Jesus Christ as the only mediator between God and man, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. We have two newsletters related to the world of the occult to which UFOs are a part. Along these lines of haunted houses, I wanted to mention here just briefly that back on July 13th, 1980, when I was actually young, my brother and me actually went out to a haunted house in Colorado County, which is close to Columbus, Texas. And what you can see here is what's supposed to be the most famous haunted house out in that particular county in Texas. What we see here is the house itself. At the time, it was unoccupied. And it was also being currently painted, as you can see in this picture. Uh, but nobody was there when we went there. Uh, the windows and the fence around the rooftop patio also can be seen. The so-called haunted house there in Colorado County called Old Stafford House. The porch is quite high off the ground, as Gary, my brother, displays by standing next to it. The house is made completely of wood, except for the chimney and a few other things. Here's a frontal view of the old Stafford Ranch House. This is supposed to be the haunted house of Colorado County. This is as close as I could get to shoot the house without too many trees, ivy, weeds, etc. obstructing the frontal view. Here we have a view from the second floor balcony overlooking the front yard of this so-called haunted house. A touch of red and orange can be seen through the trees and ivy. That's my old 1977 Dodge Aspen back there. Here's another view of the front yard of the Stafford house. The entire house is surrounded by ivy and tall oak trees covered in moss, lending to the spooky atmosphere. Gary Wessels is investigating in the shadow of the large trees. Here's a shot of the inside. The front room, probably the living room of days gone by. Chimney and the entrance to another room. Gary and myself entered the house around 5 p.m. July 13, 1980, which was a Sunday afternoon. Since the sun was still high, we gathered enough courage to go in. Gary looks out one of the ominous windows from the third floor. The staircase leads to the roof. The hole in the wall on the opposite side is exactly that. Gary peers up from the staircase leading to the second floor. I, Larry, took the picture from the third story looking down yet another stairway. Here's the wooden stairway leading from the second floor to the third floor and then third story staircase going to the fourth floor. Now in this picture, I pretend like I'm seeing a ghost as he stands next to the mailbox in one of the rooms on the first floor. The mailbox reads, Jim Bishop, Lewis something or other, Old Stafford Ranch. The house was built during the pre-Civil War days, supposedly. So, unbeknownst to us at that time, well, having survived the haunted house over in Schulenburg, Texas, here we are, both Gary and myself were students of the University of Texas at Austin. And, uh, of course, we both got our degrees from there, as well as my dad. But uh, here, it was during the summertime. We were off from school, and uh, I've kind of forgotten now after all these years, but we were either traveling back to Austin from Houston where we were visiting our parents or going the other way. So one or the other, we were passing through and we decided just to have some fun stopping at this supposed uh, haunted house. And this is supposed to be very famous over there in the Colorado County area in Texas. As a last note on this visit to this old house, I'm just glad that we went there before dark. The place was spooky enough 
during the daylight, but I can only imagine what it would have been like had we gone there at night. It would have been like going into a horror movie set or something, pretty spooky place. Uh, so, and when you check into a lot of haunted house stories, it seems like many of these stories seem to involve things that occur after dark. Okay, with that, we'll go back to the main video. So I think from what I recall, Gary and me were brave enough to go back in after you went in first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, okay, so, later. Yeah. So, so but then again, then there's no noise again. Exactly. So dad goes in, mom goes in, nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. We look all through the house. Nothing. Nothing at all. Right. Yeah. And but yet the experience was real. Right. Yeah. You know, and it was numerous times. <laughs> very, very loud. Very legible. You could uh, or audible. You could hear it very plainly. Right. Uh, but then when we went back in with everybody and looked around, nothing as usual. Nothing as usual. Yeah. So, so there you go. To me now, uh, one thing I'd like to ask Dad here, uh, didn't didn't grant your mother, my grandma Wessels, didn't she do some kind of healings, like if you had a sty in your eye or... Yeah, yeah, she could pray it away with a wedding ring and saying a prayer over it. Okay, and did she do any kind of other things that were kind of more like supernatural type things, sir? No, not that I don't recall. Okay, because I know she had that, because my, my own mother got, I think, this book called Al, Albert Magus's book of... White and black magic, and uh, she copyright did have that. She had ancient Egyptian secrets. That's it. I got the title wrong. Ancient yes. Egyptian secrets. Yeah. And in there, they got all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, it was spell. It was a spell book, <laughs> and you always start out in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but then it would say, "Get a get a rat tail, and do this, and do that, and use this, and it'll heal this." You know. And, yeah, I and, mean, it was even using chicken chicken crap, you know. For yeah, the, yeah, because you, you look at those those spells it, 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 on doing things. It was classic. But I'm, like, not, I'm not aware of it. My mother used it. Mm -hmm. um, but she had it. But she and had even you remembered the title better than yeah, I Yeah, well, I had the book until you seized it one time. Oh, that's right. That's <laughs> right. I don't know what happened to it. That's yeah, well, I've got it stored away. Well, I'm going to interject here some things about my family. As my dad and myself were just discussing, we were talking about a certain black magic type book that my grandmother, my dad's mother, in fact, you can see a picture of her right there, Julie Wessels, and her maiden name was Haverty. In fact, this old book she was using for basically witchcraft and casting spells and things may have come from either her parents, and here's a picture of them from 1880, John and Catherine Haverty on their wedding day. Those are my great-grandparents. My grandmother, I'm trying to guess from family history where this book may have come from. And the book is called Albertus Magnus. So I would, my memory was actually fairly good on that. As you can read now, this is just a copy of the book. The book itself is just falling apart. The copyright on it was 1867. And unfortunately, I didn't Xerox that page. I don't see it among here, but I remember it was copyrighted. The particular copy my grandmother Wessels had that ended up with my mother. And she started doing stuff out of this book as well. But this may have originated with my grandmother Wessel's parents, who you just saw a picture of, or it possibly could have come from my dad's father's side of the family. And uh, we see a picture here from 1870 of Mrs. Wessels, her first name Sophia Hancord, was the mother of John H. Wessels, who was my great-grandfather. Speaking of my great-grandfather, John H. Wessels, viewers at home can see this Legislative Reference Library of Texas reference of legislators and leaders. And it turns out, as you can see here, my great-grandfather, John H. Wessels, in District 66 in Chamber H, during the years 1921 through 1925, he served two terms as a legislator there for LaGrange, the city of LaGrange in Fayette County. 
and he ran as a Republican, as you can see there by the R. There it is. He was a state legislator, and it's kind of interesting that at the state capitol building in Austin, Texas, his picture is in the state capitol building twice. In fact, one time I went down in the basement of the Texas state capitol and tried to take a picture of him near the ceiling there. He was so high up on the wall that there was a chair there that I thought, well, let me stand on this chair and then try to shoot the picture. And the minute I stood on that chair in the state capitol building, it's like uh, security guards came out of the walls, three or four of them, just the minute I stepped on that chair. And uh, say, sir, step down from the chair, please. I realized that there's pretty good security at the state capitol building. But anyway, that's beside the point. As you can see here, my grandfather had a store, which is near our farm, and it says J.H. Wessels there. His picture's taken around 1910. Uh, there's some of the Wessels family out there, and that building is still standing by the old railroad tracks. Back at that time, that was a pretty important place to be. Not anymore, of course, but uh, back then, railroads were a big deal. And one last point I'll mention here. This is all just for fun, sort of. We have a picture here from 1906. That's my great-grandfather's John H. Wessel's house in Halstead, Texas, which isn't all that far from LaGrange. But that house is actually still standing. And my great-grandfather's out there along with my grandfather, Leon Wessels. He's out there as well. Oh, by the way, on this house in Halstead, notice the interview shot with my brother and my dad. This particular picture is on the wall behind my dad. It's up there on the wall, just for reference. Going way back in time concerning that witchcraft book, Leon Wessels, who's my dad's, and you see pictures of him oh, right there. But right here, it may have come from her because this picture shows her and she came to Texas in 1870 from Germany. Now, what's also interesting about that is uh, uh, on my mom's side of the family, a lot of the Warnett family, which my mom is from, and there's a picture of my mom, her side of the family came from Germany as well. And you can see an immigration document that references to Wilhelm II, the emperor of Germany. So my kinfolks on both sides of the family, my mom's side and my dad's side, and there's some Czech in there as well. Czech, uh, Czechoslovakian blood in there as well. Go way back to Europe and Germany and so forth. And so anyway, this, this old book may have come, if you look at the book itself, you see it here, Albertus Magnus, being the approved, verified, sympathetic, and natural Egyptian secrets or white and black art for man and beast. The book of nature and the hidden secrets of mysteries of life unveiled being the forbidden knowledge of ancient philosophers by that celebrated student, philosopher, chemist, and he goes into a, a litany of descriptions of this person, basically referencing to views of numerous arts and scientists, obscure, plain, practical, etc., etc., translated from the German. And this book here is Contents of Volume 2. So this apparently is the only volume that my grandmother and my mother had. Like I said, this old book is just totally falling apart. I have it hidden away somewhere in my house, and I hid it away years ago. I put it in cellophane to preserve it because the pages virtually crumble in your hands. You have to just hold it very delicately or it'll just fall apart. So what I did back then, decades ago, is I Xeroxed a few pages of it, then cellophaned it and hid it somewhere so my kids couldn't find it because I didn't want them to be messing with a book like this. Because we know in the Bible, particularly in Acts chapter 19, verse 19, there's a verse there that talks about people who are into the things like this book is about. Occult arts, black magic, white magic, or whatever called here white and black art for man and beast. It's filled with witchcraft incantations. But in Acts chapter 19, verse 19, you see there it says, many of them also which use curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. So people coming to the Christian faith would immediately destroy their witchcraft books, their black arts, their occult books. 
life in honor to God because these things are forbidden by God because the scripture makes it clear that these kinds of things are associated with demonism and the devil and things of that nature. So when you see in this cover of this old book, it translated from the German, I'm thinking maybe it might have been my great-grandparents perhaps, I'm just guessing, that brought this book or got a copy of it somehow, or maybe my grandmother herself just got a copy. But I'm thinking it passed down through the family by generation because the book itself was from 1867, which tells me it probably came from her parents, who you've seen a picture here, John and Catherine Haverty, from my grandmother Wessel's side of the family before she was married into the Wessel's family. But, uh, you know, I'm speculating on that, but just because of the age of the book, I just, you don't see it here, but I remember before I cellophaned it and stuck it away somewhere where it would take me forever to go find it again. I know it's, I have an idea where it is, but I don't want to go and bother digging through a zillion things to try to find it. So I'm just settling for using this old Xerox copy I took. But uh, I'm thinking it, it came from that source. And of course, my grandmother Wessels then apparently influenced my mom. As you see their pictures, there's Julie Wessels and my grandfather with her. And then there's my mom was influenced by this stuff. And it just passed down generationally through time to where it affected both my grandmother and my, my mother. And no telling what other kinds of effects were going on with the rest of the family with a book like this in their presence. Now, just to analyze this in brief, I'm a little worried because I don't want to show too much of these witchcraft spells that my my uh, grandmother Wessels and my mom were using. Looking here on page 58 in the index to volume one, the spells in this book deal with these following things. And my grandmother Wessels, she used to, in Fayette County there in Schulenburg, that's where she would solve a lot of problems for people that had things, or like my dad with the stye in his eye. She could get a, a wedding ring and then do these, as dad said, prayers or whatever else she had to do according to these spells in this book to get something cleared up. So you see at the top of the page there on the left-hand column, it says to alleviate pains. You've got palsy and an epilepsy, pestilence, pigeons, how to prevent from deserting their coops, powder for the gravel, for plaster, to draw from a body poison, whereby on one may protect himself, powerful means against bullet, and sword against enemies of all evil and danger, prevent persons from doing evil unto you, procreative organs to strengthen, protect the body from the dangers of weapons, etc., pulmonary diseases, and it just goes on, putrid mouth, rats and mice, as you just go down the page, there's too many for me to read them all, but and as you look over to the other side of the page, you go more into a toothache, to detect a thief, urine to tell by the urine what's going on, udder of a cow when bewitched, and so forth, just down the page. Just freeze frame, if you're watching on YouTube, just freeze frame the screen. You can see all the different things this book covers, at least some of them. This isn't even all of them. This is just one of the you know, a couple of pages I, I happen to Xerox. There's so much more. But you look down there, you got to know when cattle are plagued by witches, you got uh, worms in any part of the body and so forth down there in the W's. But anyway, this is basically a witchcraft book. Oh, and look here, I'm just turning the page here. We go down to page, you know, index for volume two. Uh, you've got pages 126, 127. And once again, you have all these things that the witchcraft spells in this book will deal with if you need help on that. So you can freeze frame the screen there and see what kind of spells this thing covers. Now, we know from Scripture, particularly like where I just mentioned how Christians, when they got converted to Christianity in obedience to God, they destroyed their witchcraft books. This is one reason, because I wanted to use this, this book as a, an apologetic tool to refute witchcraft and so forth, biblically. You know, normally I would have just destroyed it, like when I was a dungeon master. Any of those of you out there that don't know, I used to be a, a Dungeons and Dragons dungeon master. And when I had my conversion to Christ, in fact, if you want to learn more about that, you can see my personal testimony 
testimony of a D and D dungeon master on YouTube, and I'll give you my full account there. But one of the things I did after I got, was converted to Christ and I started to realize that this game D and D was not of God and was really just an incredible waste of time, violating Ephesians chapter five verse sixteen. I decided, you know, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I didn't want to waste my time with evil games like that. So I I threw away almost all my D&D stuff. I think I saved my Dungeon Master guide just in case I ever did something to expose this to the public. But most of everything else I just destroyed, just threw it all in the trash. Years of D&D stuff, I just threw it away, just like these guys in Acts chapter 19, verse 19. Okay, now what I'm going to do here is actually show you just a smidgen of some of this witchcraft stuff. It's kind of hard to read, and maybe that's a good thing, because I really don't want people to be utilizing this stuff in any way whatsoever, because it's actually related to demonology. But there's uh, spells and things here that you can utilize from this book, according to this. But looking here on... And it's hard to even make this out, but it looks like page 64 and 65, Egyptian Secrets, Albert Magus at the top there. But you've got uh, stuff about uh, that no witch may leave a church down near the bottom. Uh, you also have to cite a witch. And then it tells you the things you have to go through to deal, you know, if you want to solve that problem. To cite a witch, for instance, says take an earthen pot, not glazed, Yarn spun by a yet seven years old. Put the water of the bewitched into the pot. Then take the egg of a black hen and the yarn and move the latter three times round the ejaculate in the three devil's name. After this, put into the water the pot seal lid of the vessel that no fumes may ooze therefrom. But observe that the lid is below while setting the pot upon the... Oh, announce the following. See, some of the words are missing, so I can't read them all. That's why it's kind of hard. Lucifer, devil, summation, the before, the witch of, or me, in the three devil's name. So you see, you've got to do all this weird stuff. Getting a pot and yarn and a black hen and all this type of stuff and, and use it in a spell. You see up here of witches and sorcery at the bottom of the page. Fasten a squill, see onion, over the principal. Now, some of this is missing. Also, no person will come to trouble you. And then there's just these spell type things you have to do to make these things work. And then going on to another page, a couple of pages here. It's hard to make out. I'm having trouble reading this myself. But it's just to demonstrate what a black magic book like this says. But now I can tell from this one, like you have here, the art of extinguishing fire without the aid of water. And then you have these letters here on, on the right-hand side of the column. Now, what's funny about that is my mother, when I was a kid growing up, used to write these witchcraft spells with these kind of letters in here and had me carry it in my wallet, made me promise to carry it. And it was a spells of protection, so no harm would come to me. And I had that in my wallet for years, not really understanding, but I promised my mom I'd carry it, not realizing at the time it was coming from a witchcraft book that she was using. And of course, my mother used to be in communication with the dead. She was often talking about talking to her dead mother and other dead relatives, you know, which is sort of like a seance, you know, but we're forbidden to do things like that. Like you get in Deuteronomy chapter 18, for instance, communication with the dead is, is not what you're supposed to be doing because basically it's saying you're not really communicating with the dead, but you're communicating with demons who are pretending to be the long lost loved ones. But another thing that's interesting here, down at the bottom, and that was so interesting. If I had the whole book, if I could go and find where I hid that old book and bring it out where I could really show you a lot of stuff other than the, these few Xerox copies I have of it, it was just filled with Christian terminology from one end to the other. It was always saying, well, start this spell in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Do this, you know, in the name of Jesus and all this type of stuff. So it made it look like it was really Christian related. 
when really it was not by any means whatsoever. But the devil's very cunning. He's smart. He knows how to deceive people wholly. So he made this book look like it was some kind of Christian book that was all right. Even looking at the bottom of this page, basically what I'm saying about this witchcraft book is that it uses all kinds of biblical terminology. And even if you look at the bottom of this page 40 here from this book in this bad copy I've got uh, from Xerox copy from the original, it says, St. Peter and Jesus moved upon the acre. They dug up three furrows where they found three worms. The one was white and the other is black. The third is red. Henceforth, and it's missing something there, all the worms are dead. Three times and the spell goes on right above that to vanquish a man but basically you've got a lot of phony what looks like biblical information thrown in a lot of the spells in this book begin with in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit which is pure deception because when you read the bible you find that all these things are to be forsaken and rejected because it's part of the world of the satanic kingdom so basically i'm bringing this into the picture to show people that the instances of haunted houses and strange occurrences such as this or what Carl Jung engaged himself in, the things he observed, you know, he was involved in seances, speaking with the dead and stuff. And biblically speaking, this, this is engaging with demonic spirits. And those are fourth dimension beings that can come into our third dimension where we are in the physical realm. This witchcraft book is trying to present itself as if it were some kind of Bible-based reference source because it has spells, a lot of them. They're not in my few copies I have from the book. Like I said, I really didn't want to have that book around where my kids could get at it or anything else since I opted not to do the Acts chapter 19, verse 19 way of just destroying it on the spot. I just figured there might be a good apologetic purpose to help people avoid these kinds of things. But the deception here much like the deception in a lot of these so-called Bible-based cults like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, all, they, they use Bible terminology uh, to make themselves look like they're Christians, but that's just a deception to get people to buy into that religious cult. Well, the occult, sorcery and witchcraft is no different. It's just a, a trick the devil's used for millennia to deceive people into thinking, hey, this is good stuff. Look, I, it mentions Bible stuff. Well, a lot of these spells in the book start out with, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And what's amazing about all this, I remember my grandmother Wessels used to take me to church on Sunday when I was there in Schulenburg as a small child. She would take me to church, and I still remember in my mind's eye, there at that old Lutheran church in Schulenburg, yet she's consistently and constantly using these witchcraft spells to help people out or my dad or whoever, you know, for whatever she needs. And then that generationally was transferred over to my mom who started doing all this stuff. And, you know, mom would go to church and stuff like this, but she's into this stuff. And uh, so that just shows you the deception. Just so many spells start with the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so you're thinking, hey, this is Christian, this is biblical, but it's playing on the ignorance of the reader not knowing enough about what the scripture says about things like this. And so the correlation here is then that what my grandmother Wessels was doing was dabbling in the things of the devil, of the demonic. And when you do that, you're inviting the supernatural entities, the unholy, unclean spirits, demonic, the uh, fallen angels, into your area, into into not only your home, but uh, your entire uh, sphere of influence. And this can lead to all kinds of troubles. My own Christian ministry was inspired by world-famous Christian apologist Walter Martin, author of The Kingdom of the Cults and The Kingdom of the Occult, among many other books. On our YouTube channel, you'll find videos we've done on Walter Martin. In fact, here's one. Walter Martin inspired our Christian Answers Apologetics and Evangelism Ministry, 1 Peter 3.15. Another one, Walter Martin's Cults Reference Bible, a perfect street witnessing tool for Christian evangelists. Here's a few clips by Brother Martin on what he had to say about spells, witchcraft, and the world of the occult. A witch 
is a male or a female who utilizes occultic powers for good or evil ends. Hence the designation a white or a black witch. In effect, a witch is a medium who utilizes occultic phenomena or powers to bring about what they call good or evil. Anton LaVey, who is the founder of the First Church of Satan in San Francisco, has made a very succinct observation. I don't often quote a high priest of the cult of Satan, but in this case I will because he's done his homework. LaVey has researched witchcraft in the United States and in Europe very thoroughly. And he has pointed this out, and it's worth noting. There is no such thing as a white witch. White witchcraft, says LaVey, is pure mythology. All witches are drawing upon occultic power, and that power does not originate with God. Now, the word occult, as I explained the other night, comes from the Latin occultus, which means what? The secret mysteries or the hidden things. And it has no part in Judaism or in Christianity. Now, if we're going to face witchcraft for what it is today, I think we had better understand that the practice of occultic or secret rites, which actually is what witchcraft is, spells and curses, etc., to attain one's own desired ends is never, ever connected with Christianity. It is never, ever connected with authorization from the Bible, from Judaism or Christianity, unless it is wrenched out of context and therefore has no real bearing on the subject. Witchcraft itself is nothing more than the practice of occultism. It is an attempt to manipulate forces to your own end. And there are people all over attempting it today. We don't know how many there are, but there are a lot of them. And I don't mean the kind that grace our television screens in The Wizard of Oz, with the pointed hats and the shoes and the broomsticks. I'm talking now about witches or mediums, as the Old Testament calls them, sorcerers, in the classic sense of the term. The other day I happened to be speaking at the uh, Sunday school convention out in Chicago, which draws the largest number of people to it in the country, Chicagoland Sunday school convention. And while I was there, I walked into the store, and there was a little book put out by that great occultic publishing house, the Dell Publishing Company. And along with their diet books and other things, from which we have all profited from time to time, <laughs> there was a little book that caught my eye, and it said, Everyday Witchcraft. 25 cents. Naturally, I was interested in everyday witchcraft, and so I purchased it. It was written by a lady who apparently knows what she's talking about because the material contained in it conforms to the literature of contemporary witchcraft. And the cover says, love, magic, charms, and spells, fortune-telling, everything you need know to enjoy occult power. Now here's occultism for the masses, witchcraft for the millions, made easy. And you can buy it, and it gives you the essentials of sorcery. And as I read through it, I was struck by the fact that even in something as simple and rudimentary as this, and incidentally it's quite accurate, there appeared this statement, and I want to quote it, simply because it's a secular publication, not a religious one. Therefore, it has tremendous importance. Listen, though you needn't be a witch to practice witchcraft, there are some witchy things you must do if you are to summon occult powers. Then it goes on to tell you the basic rules. Now notice how it begins. There are some witchy things you must do for what purpose? To summon occult powers. The opening gun of the pamphlet is an open admission of exactly what the principle of witchcraft is, namely... You are summoning forces to do your bidding. Now, in the Far East, everybody understands occultism. There are little spirit houses outside in Thailand and throughout all Asia where the spirits are cared for. Demonism is a common thing in the Eastern religions. It's only uncommon to us because we have not seen it in the raw. 
But we are going to see it as the forces of Satan burst out into the world. And they are bursting out onto the college campuses and into the churches and into our schools. I would draw also to your attention something else in this book. On page 31, there appears this interesting and I think very revealing statement. The statement says, Various malign influences are always loose in the atmosphere. No matter what you do or don't do, one day these forces may decide to focus on you or your family. However, when you start practicing witchcraft, the chances of drawing the attention of these mischief makers increases greatly. Close quote. That is one of the best statements I have ever heard of exactly what you are looking for. When you start reaching out for the unopened door of witchcraft and you turn the knob, what's coming through is a malign influence. And there are great risks involved that you can ill afford to become involved with. Now, witchcraft is today very popular. Every day witchcraft for everybody. But there's danger in it. The State College at San Diego has at the present moment the distinction of granting a bachelor's degree in magic. I thought that's particularly interesting. And they are teaching courses at the present moment. One of the courses taught by a witch. University of California at Berkeley granted a bachelor's degree in magic to one man who is involved right now in the cult of Satan. If you pick up a telephone in Cleveland, Ohio, you've heard of Avis and you've heard of Hertz and you've heard of National and Dollar a Day. Rent a car. You may now rent a witch. That is correct. By simply calling Rent a Witch. For $25 to $200, you may have readings of tarot cards, fortune telling, and even seances performed for you at your parties. So call up and rent a witch and have a metaphysical evening. The mass media has greatly assisted this. Rosemary's Baby, The Brotherhood of Satan, The Mark of Satan, The Brotherhood of the Bell, The Motion Picture, The Devil, and multiple other ones are all aimed at one thing, interest in witchcraft and in Satanism. Bewitched, I Dream of Genie, Nanny and the Professor, and Barnabas with his fangs showing in dark shadows. All aims at but one thing. The supernatural and witchcraft. And there are witches abounding in the scripts of dark shadows. There's even Barbara the Grey Witch. She's neither black nor white. She's grey. Depending, of course, I suppose, upon her motivation. You can get records of Barbara telling you how to practice witchcraft. Anton LaVey has also done some recordings of the Satanic Mass, a perversion of Christianity, and readings from his own Satanic Bible. Witchcraft is in, and popular, and powerful, and growing. It is in Europe, and it is spread to the United States and growing with astounding vitality. People are fascinated by the unknown and challenged by any attempt to know the future and to control it. That's why they go for tarot cards. That's why they go for palm reading. That's why they go for astrology. That's why they reach into the world of the occult and that's why they go into witchcraft. They're fascinated by power and by its control. And they can reach out and know something about you and about the person next to you and the neighbor next door and they can exert authority and power. That's what witchcraft offers, and they're reaching for it. And finally, there just simply is reality in the world of the supernatural and in the world of the witches. It's there, and people have experienced it, and they are testifying to the validity of that experience. Because of it, people are interested, they're moving in the direction of witchcraft, and it's become popular, faddish, and very much the vogue. Now, in the face of all this, what does the Christian church have to say? Do we sit by and say, this is terrible, we simply have to do something about this one of these days? Or, 
Do we satisfy ourselves by quoting a couple of Bible verses and then discontinue interest? Or do we learn the biblical position and then take some definitive action? I think the last must be our choice. So let's take our Bibles. How many of you brought them this evening? Good. Let's find out what God has to say on the subject of witchcraft. Because it makes very interesting reading. We have already seen God's attitude toward mediums, towards those who play around with the future and delve into supernatural things, the witches and those who practice witchcraft. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 18 for a moment and see something a little bit further in the mind of God on this subject. Beginning at verse 9, the warning of God. When you have come into the land which the Lord thy God gives thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abomination of those nations. You ought to circle the word abomination. Very strong word in the Hebrew. There shall not be found among you any one that makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire. That was a common practice of paganism. Devil worship. Or that uses divination. Very, very common practice today. Attempting to find out something by supernatural means. Or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. The word witch is the word medium. Exactly what it means. A medium. A charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits. That is a spirit that possesses the body of an animal and sometimes a person. Or a wizard or a necromancer. That is somebody who is fascinated with the art of communicating with the dead. Now I want you to look at verse 12. This is God's judgment on the people who practice these things. And he's covered the whole spectrum of witchcraft and the occult. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God does drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. What was God's view? He repeats it three times. You can't possibly fail to get the message. Abomination. 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 Don't do it. I drove out the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites. I gave you this glorious land of milk and honey. I have given you the land of Israel and drove out the people that lived here because they practiced these things. Don't you do it or out you go. Those that want to hear more from Walter Martin can simply type his name in the YouTube search box or to see our particular videos dealing with Walter Martin can type Walter Martin See Answers TV in the YouTube search box. So what we have here then is the reason, I believe, of why that house in Schulenburg was haunted. It was a, like a spook house, as my brother likes to say. You've got all this poltergeist activity and things of that nature because of what my grandmother is engaging in. It's like you're just opening the front door of your house and you're yelling out, Hey, demons! Uh, you poltergeist, you unclean spirits, come on in here. I need you to help me with these spells so I can cast these spells and, you know, find things I need to use to cast a spell for this or a, a spell for that. If I need to find treasure, I'll use this spell. If I need to take care of a, a cow, I'll use that spell. It just depends on what it is. You know, a sty in the eye, like my dad always talks about how she cured him of that, using that the spell for that. So the reason, it's just common sense figuring this stuff out. Basic witchcraft. Witchcraft comes in different forms. White, neutral, or black. Black magic admits to two separate deities, good and evil. Only they prefer to worship the evil deity. Neutral magic believes there is one God who can take the form of good or evil depending on the situation and worshiper. They believe they can control the forces of nature for either good or evil. White magic tries to combine Christianity and witchcraft for the good of mankind. Many times Christian phrases or symbols 
grouped in threes, are used in charms and cures for psychic ills. Of course, you can see there just a few of God's opinions found in Scripture about the subject of witchcraft and sorcery. Going back to my Encyclopedia of Occultism and Parapsychology now, of course, this encyclopedia is not a Christian book at all, but it does just give you a general framework for what we're talking about when it comes to witchcraft. You see here on page 990, it says, The cult of persons who, by means of satanic assistance or the aid of evil spirits or familiars, are enabled to practice minor black magic. But the difference between the sorcerer and the witch is that the former has sold his soul to Satan for complete dominion over him for a stated period, whereas the witch usually appears as the devoted and often badly treated servant of the diabolic power. And uh, it goes on to say, but she is often mistress of a familiar, her bowden slave, and among certain savage peoples, her occult powers are self-evolved. And of course, if you want to read more about that, as I say over and over again in this particular video presentation, just freeze frame, and you can see additional information there about what the uh, occult encyclopedia has to say about that. Now, also looking on page 857 of this encyclopedia, under spells, it says, spells, incantations, a written or spoken formula of words supposed to be capable of magical effects. And it goes on from that page to quite a bit of information here about spells and so forth over here on page 858. It's even interesting that here on page 858, you see down on the first column, halfway down, it, it mentions Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, bless the bed that I lie on. So even these witchcraft spells and so forth utilize biblical terms and terminology in their use, which can be very deceptive to the user. And if you look over on the other side of that page on 858, you can see the word Egypt in bold print there. And of course, that's what this other book is basically claiming that it's coming from. As you can see there again, just as a reminder, what does it say? It says Albertus Magnus, and it says Egyptian secrets on white and black art for man and beast. Now, what's curious about this is notice also here in volume one of this encyclopedia of occultism and parapsychology, there he is, Albertus Magnus. No fewer than 21 folio volumes are attributed to this alchemist. Although it is highly improbable that all of them are really his, the ascription in several cases resting on, but slender evidence, those others, which are incontestably from his pen, are sufficiently numerous to constitute him a surprisingly voluminous writer. It is noteworthy, moreover, that according to tradition, he was the inventor of the pistol and the cannon. But while it is unlikely that the credit is due to him for this, the mere fact that he was thus acknowledged indicates that his scientific skill was recognized by a few, if only a few, of the men of his own time. Well, reading from this encyclopedia about Albertus Magnus, you can freeze the frame again here on the screen, or you can freeze the screen once again if you want to read what the encyclopedia has to say about this guy. So I'm able to even find out about this old book that my grandmother and my mother both used and even find it in this occult encyclopedia. So this is not just some unknown minor stuff that we're dealing with here. Okay, I, I could say a lot more about this, but uh, for the meantime, I'll just mention these things. Why do people get involved in the occult? One would be to contact the dead. Another reason, to see the future. Another reason, to obtain power. Another reason, to contact Satan or demons. Another reason, to satisfy curiosity or the need for excitement gained through frightening experiences. Satanic counterfeits of the divine miracles. Now, if you look at precognition, Divine miracles are found in like Micah chapter 5 verse 2, 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 through 21. But satanic miracles 
along these lines are fortune tellers, psychics, false prophets, astrologers, etc., as found in Deuteronomy chapter 13, verses 1 through 4, and Isaiah 47, verses 9 through 14. We have things such as levitation, divine levitation in 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 6, John chapter 6, verse 16 through 21, Acts chapter 1, verse 9. A satanic counterfeit, though, is found in Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and verse 8. There's teleportation. The divine attributes are Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11, John chapter 6, verse 21, and Acts chapter 8, 39 through 40. But satanic miracles along these lines of levitation are Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 8. There's molecular transformation found in Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 through 21, and John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. Satanic molecular transportation is found in Exodus chapter 7, verse 22. There's the creation of matter out of nothing that's found in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, and John chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. Apportation, possible, but not creation, ex nihilo. So, the devil can't do that one as far as matter. That's why when you see these, these haunted houses and things, it's always something not really physical. It's more of a specter type thing, such as like you have with UFOs. They violate all types of physical laws of physics. And the main reason for that is they're not really physical. I'm going to concentrate basically from this old newsletter that I worked on on page five, starting with point four, what can Satan do? And this is along the same lines of what I was just reading to you a moment ago. What can Satan do? A, he is a very powerful angel. As such, his strength and intelligence are far superior to man's. B, he is capable of, and you can see it there, one, supra-dimensional teleportation. That's Job chapter one, verses six and seven. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence cometh thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And this explains a lot of things materializing and dematerializing when it comes to haunted houses, ghosts, specters, poltergeists, things of that nature. Two, see visual materialization in various forms, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Three, he can apport objects and people from place to place, Matthew chapter 4, verses 5 and 8. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on a pinnacle of the temple. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Four, molecular transformation of matter. And I mentioned that earlier. Exodus chapter 7, verses 12 through 22. For they cast every man his own rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Verse 22. And the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Neither did he hearken unto them as the Lord had said. Five, counterfeit miracles. Exodus chapter 8, verse 7. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 through 15. Exodus 8, verse 7. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. Revelation chapter 13, verses 13 through 15. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by the sword 
and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Point six, spontaneous human combustion. Job chapter one, verse 16, and Revelation 13, 13. Job chapter one, verse 16 says, while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, the fire of God has fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Revelation chapter 13, verses 13, And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. 7. Possession of the minds of non-Christians. Second Timothy chapter 2, verses 25 and 26 in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God preadventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Point eight, thought transference or implantation. First Chronicles chapter 21 verse 1 in Matthew chapter 16, verses 22 and 23. First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Matthew chapter 16, 22 and 23 says, Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Verse 23, but he turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Death, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. Point 10. Hindering man's ability to comprehend the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them. 11. Produce bodily illness. Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 through 33. Luke 13, 11 through 17. Matthew chapter 9, verses 32 and 33. As they went out, behold, they brought to him a dumb man possessed with a devil. Verse 33. And when the devil was cast out, the dumb spake, and the multitudes marveled, saying, It was never so seen in Israel. Luke chapter 13, verses 11 through 17. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity 18 years and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. And when Jesus saw her, he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Verse 13. And he laid his hands on her and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because that Jesus had healed on the Sabbath day, and said unto the people, There are six days in which men ought to work. In them therefore come and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Verse 15. The Lord then answered him and said, Thou hypocrite, dost not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or his ass from the stall, and lead him away to watering? Verse 16, And ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan hath bound, lo, these eighteen years, he loosed from the bond on the Sabbath day? And when he had said these things, all his adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. 
point 12, produce mental illness. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. And no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him, and cried with a loud voice and said, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, What is thy name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send him away out of the country. Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding. And all the devils besought him, saying, Send us into the swine, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine. And the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. There were about two thousand and were choked in the sea. 13, incite opposition to God. Acts chapter 13, verses 6 through 12. And when they had gone through the isle unto Pathos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimas, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. 14. Remove the word of God from the mind. Matthew 13 verse 19. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. 15. Manipulate the weather. Job chapter 1, verse 19. Matthew chapter 4, verses 35 through 39. Job chapter 1, verse 19. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 39. And the same day when the even was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship, so that it was now full. And he was in the hinter part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him, and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. Point 16. Hinder answers to prayer. Daniel chapter 10 verses 12 through 14 verses 20 and 21. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, 
For from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. And also here in Daniel chapter 10, but now in verses 20 and 21 we read, Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grisha shall come. But I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. 17. Tempt people to sin. 1 Thessalonians 3, 5. For this cause, when I no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. 18. Invent false religions and ideas. 2 Corinthians 11, 3-4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1-3. 1, 1 John 4, 1-3. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 3 and 4. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye received another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, in commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God, Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist. Wherefore, ye have heard that it should come, and even now already it is in the world. Point 19. Manipulate things to bring financial disaster or wealth to individuals. Job chapter 1 verse 3, verses 13 and 19, Matthew chapter 4 verses 8 and 9, 1 Timothy chapter 6, 9 through 10. Job 1 3 says, His substance also was 7,000 sheep and 3,000 camels and 500 yoke of oxen and 500 she-asses and a very great household, so that this man was the greatest of all men of the east. Now going on to verses 13 through 19. And there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Verse 17. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands, 
and fell upon the camels, and they have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Matthew chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. First Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Point 20. Disrupt the assembly of the saints by his presence or by inciting disunity, lies, divisions, etc. Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 10 and also Acts chapter 6 verse 1. Acts chapter 5 verses 1 through 10. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Spirit, and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold... Was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out, and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. Also, Acts chapter 6, verse 1 says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. 21. Satan can guide the spirit and actions of nations. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13, Revelation 16, 14, Revelation 20, 7 through 9. Daniel chapter 10, verse 13. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Revelation chapter 16, verse 14. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation chapter 20, 7 through 9. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth, and compassed the camp of the saints about, and the beloved city, 
and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. 22. Keep believers in a constant state of depression and discouragement. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Point 23, Satan can send a messenger to be a thorn in the flesh in a believer to vex his or her spirit as long as they live. No, God uses this demonic device to keep believers humble by revealing their weakness and an absolute dependence on God's grace. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, By grace it is sufficient for thee, for thy strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Point 24. Kill the body of excommunicated believers. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5. To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And point 25. Communicate with people during seances and other occultic rites. That's found in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 9 through 11. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. And of course here I'll let you just look at a, a wide shot of the entire page for those of you who want to freeze frame it and look over all the data that's available there. Also, one other thing to notice from the researcher newsletter, there on page 5, number 4, it says, What are the signs of demon possession? Definition. Demon possession occurs when Satan himself or one or more demons enter the body of a non-Christian and take control of it and forces the person's mind into an unconscious state. In effect, an alien mind takes over the person. This mind will do the thinking, speaking, etc. When the demon or demons leave the person, that person does not generally remember anything that happened during the time of their possession. Moving to page 6, it says, A. In many cases, there are no outward signs until confronted by possible exorcism. That's Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. B. When there are outward manifestations of demon possessions, the most significant sign is that of an altered personality, which is usually evil and malicious. That's Mark chapter 5, verses 2 through 15. Some of the following may be signs of possession. One, dual or multiple personalities. Mark 5, 2 through 5, and verse 15. Two, different voices, genders, even languages. Mark chapter 5, verse 7. Three, the voice talks about the person it possesses. Mark chapter 5, verses 9 and following. Point four, you can talk with the demon directly. Mark chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. 5. Sudden suicidal or homicidal desires. Mark chapter 5, verse 5. 6. The demon will give you its name. Mark chapter 5, verse 9. 7. The evil personality 
leaves when commanded in Jesus' name and the person's normal personality resurfaces. That's Mark chapter 5, verse 18. And eight, long-term depression or sudden ecstatic state. There's much more I could say about all this, but the viewers can simply look at the page as it goes down to get more information there. One of the men of God I like to listen to on Sermon Audio in his broadcast of Generations is Kevin Swanson. He does great uh, biblical analysis of current events, world events, political events, things of that nature. And I think at this moment that I'm doing this, he has over 4,000 messages on Sermon Audio from his Generations broadcast. Anyway, here he is doing a message that's pertinent to the subject of this video called Demon Possession on the Rise in the West, which he broadcast on May 8th, 2018. You know, one of the things that we have to watch out for is there, there is a fair amount of exorcism that is rep reputedly happening through priests belonging to the Sons of Siva exorcism department, <laughs> and that's not healthy. No. You remember the Sons of Siva? Yeah, they uh, they were unable to cast out any demons. Yeah, Weren't they the ones that get got beat up and thrown out naked? And, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That was them okay. in the book of Acts. You remember they, they were saying in the name of Jesus, in the name of Paul, and the, um, the demon says, Paul, we know, and Jesus, Jesus we, we know, know. <laughs> but who are you? Right. So... That's not a good position to be in. No. Yeah. But, uh, but is there a rise of demonic activity in the Western world? And I, I, have to, I have to say there must be something of that. Now, I treat that in my book, Apostate, The Men Who Destroyed the Christian West, because there are clear references on the part of the great philosophers of the 19th century who were very instrumental in opening the floodgates to the sheer evil that has overcome the Western world. And these philosophers many of whom would acknowledge Lucifer. They would talk about Lucifer. I'm talking about Mark Twain, Frederick Nietzsche, and John Paul Sartre, and, mm -hmm. and uh, Karl Marx. The, these, these men acknowledged it. It wasn't just other people saying it. They acknowledged their alliance with Satan. Mark, Mark Twain, for example, at the end of his life, wrote letters to the earth, which were letters penned from Satan himself to the archangels. Wow. And, and he acknowledged that and told his daughter not to publish these or, you know, something terrible would happen. Now, they were published in the 1950s, I believe, some 40, 50 years after Mark Twain died. Now, of course, it's important for us to understand the influence that the uh, demonic world had on guys like Nathaniel Hawthorne, Mark Twain, Karl Marx, Frederick Nietzsche, and others. There, there was tremendous spiritual satanic influence going on in America in the 19th century. Abraham Lincoln invited uh, witches into the White House. He and Franklin Pierce were the two presidents in the history of the United States that invited witches into the White House to conduct seances. People have said, and this is, this, is, this is obvious historical records that we include in our upcoming American history course of, that we are releasing called In God's Providence. But it's important for people to understand the history of America in terms of inviting satanic forces to operate in this country in the 19th century. So I think also the music business has been infiltrated by satanic influences. There should, should be almost no question about that because these musicians themselves acknowledge it. Remember David Bowie, who was in uh, the, the home of one of the members of the Led Zeppelin band, and he said the house was completely filled with dumb demons, yeah. and he, he, I think he crawled out a window to try to get out of it. He says it was, the most, it was a horrendous experience. Uh, so that's, of course, in my book, Apostate, The Men Who Destroy the Christian West as well. Um, but, uh, but I think people need to understand that we have unleashed, we have welcomed as a nation. As a nation, we have welcomed satanic influence through our philosophers, our literary giants, and our musical influences of the last 50, 60 years at least. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, you, you had the rise of the death metal bands and things like that during the 80s and 90s, and I'm sure they're still going on now, too. Uh, Slayer was one of them who actually said that they were demon-possessed and that they worshipped Satan and things like that. It was just it was crazy. And it continues with Marilyn Manson and others as well. But, friends, also one more reason why there's demonic activity in this country is because there's far less Christian influence in this country. You, you've you interview the number of people believe that the Bible is God's Word. It's dropped off from some 40% to 23%. So there's half 
half of the people who claimed the Bible was the Word of God in 1980, 37 years later, right now, there's only half of those people who would claim the Bible to be the Word of God today. Yeah, and even less that actually say that they right. live there's, a biblical there's lifestyle. Only five or five <laughs> or six percent of millennials, five or six percent of millennials that are evangelicals, and they take a position against homosexual marriage. Wow. Five to six percent. So these people out there, these Christian ministries that are pretending that American Christianity is still uh, this gigantic force in America, and we're going to make all kinds of progress with our ministries. No, no, no. We are in the minority, my friends. Now, of course, we're, we're the David against Goliath and so forth, but I think we need to understand the cultural upper hand that homosexuality and sexual sin has had on this nation. When you have the Supreme Court of the United States legitimizing the killing of 100 million babies and legitimizing homosexual marriage, friends, this is the most abominable sin approved of by the most powerful principalities and powers in the nation, and you're saying Satan's not involved in this? Yeah. You're saying that Satan is not involved with Justice Kennedy in his decision to bring homosexual marriage into America, that is the neuronic vision from Caesar Nero that uh, appeared in AD 66, around the same time the Great Persecution was launched against the Christian church. Are, are you saying that Satan is not involved at all in what is going with the Supreme Court of the United States? Friends, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We wrestle not against Justice Kennedy, primarily. We, we wrestle against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age. So there's two traps, I think, that, that we need to watch out for, two ditches on this. The one is to ignore and uh, to, to take the demonic activity too lightly. On the other hand, some pl- overplay the power of the demonic world, and we don't want to do either of these. Yeah, and you can fall into either ditch. You can just deny that the spiritual realm exists except for God. But, I mean, if you're going to believe in God and believe in His Word, He talks about angels and demons as well but then you there there's some people out there that they see demons everywhere i <laughs> like like what brad stein said you know the catholic church tends to see mary everywhere and a lot of the protestants see demons everywhere yeah. and so it's, and there's an over influence uh, over emphasis upon uh, the demon world among some of the protestants i don't know why the christian church has gone towards paid counselors you know jesus never said give me 500 bucks i'll fix your marriage yeah for fifty hundred bucks, I'll get you saved. You know, you don't get that from Jesus, do you? No. It just seems like there's something wrong with this approach. Jesus didn't say, "Okay, seventy guys, you guys want to cast out demons? Um, okay, it'd be three grand each." Um, Judas, where's the money bag? Where's the money bag, Judas? Um, <laughs> yeah. That's two hundred ten thousand bucks. So what we're going to do is we're going to train all seventy of you. Now, now we need three thousand bucks from each of you. It's just something wrong with that. It seems to me there are some things that should not be monetized. Yeah, and and merchandised and all of that. Friends, what do you do when you've got demonic influences in your community or in your family? Or perhaps the church senses there's a demonic presence, there's a demonic influence that's going after somebody. What do you do? Do you you go around looking for the expert on exorcism, the guy who can pray the right prayers, the guy who's got the right recipe, the guy— or, or, or are we looking for somebody who, who has a relationship with Jesus? Yeah, who can preach the gospel. Yeah, he, he <laughs> yeah. knows Jesus. He's been walking with Jesus. He, he's got faith. He's, got, he's, he's a man of prayer and fasting. Yeah. I mean, that's, it's the basic stuff. It's not, where's your certificate? Have you been certified <laughs> to be an exorcist? Yeah. We don't need that. We need a man of faith, a man filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Does that make sense? Am, am I being too simple here? And I don't think so. I, I, because... You know, he leads us into power. It, it, it's not us that does this. It's Christ in us by his Holy Spirit mm-hmm. that we could do anything. I find it interesting that Jesus didn't even do miracles until the Holy Spirit came upon him. Mm-hmm. And so it was by the Holy Spirit. So if we see any type of miracle, it's not because I laid hands on you. Mm-hmm. It's, it's Christ in me by the Holy Spirit that you know is using his power through me. And when the disciples could not cast that big demon out of the little boy, you remember at the foot of the hill of the Mount of Transfiguration? Yeah. Uh, you remember he he was upset. Jesus was upset. Jesus yeah. was saying, there's a lack of faith here. He said, if you have the faith as a mustard seed, you could just move this mountain from right here to over there. He says, the issue is faith. And then he also said that this kind comes not out, but by prayer and fasting. 
So in other words, what are we looking for? We're looking for a man of faith, a man who's given to prayer and fasting. There's, there's somebody in the church who just, he's six, seven, eight hours a day in prayer and fasting. He hasn't attended Exorcism 101 and Exorcism 201 and 301 and give his three grand and got the certification. He doesn't have any of that. What he has is faith. Men of faith. Now, in lieu of not having faith, you might need a certificate. Yeah. <laughs> Are you with me? Yeah. You might need to go to the Sons of Siva school of you, exorcism. You, yeah. you might need to. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. No, I wouldn't recommend that. No. I would not recommend that. A couple other things that come to my mind as we consider the the, the modern issue of exorcism, um, and that is, do we fear God first and foremost and recognize the absolute authority of the Lord Jesus Christ on the right hand of the Father? And this certainly was the way with the apostles. They understood the authority of Jesus. Here, the other thing is, we need to be aware of whether there's conversion, whether there's oppression or possession. I don't believe that Christians can be possessed. No. Uh, but there may be some who are seeking Jesus who are being oppressed and may be possessed. And so I think we, we need to be somewhat sensitive to the situation. Jesus said, you know, you cast out a demon out of the house, the seven worst ones will come back in if, if the house is empty. Right. And I think what he mean, means by that is if, if there's an individual who, who does not receive Jesus, he is not indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, He's been delivered of one, and yet the Holy Spirit of God has not entered into the man. He is subject to even worse problems in the future. So let's be sure that we're applying biblical truth uh, to the issue of Satan's involvement. And most important of all, invoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Indeed, David says, I come to thee. Not with the sword, not with the spear, not with the shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. And that's how he cast down that giant. And uh, we do the same thing uh, as Peter and John did in the temple. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So claim the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that is included in that name, the name of Jesus, who's above all names, who is the power over all powers, who is above all principalities and powers, and he's above all things to the church, uh, claim the power and the influence and the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ as you, uh, as you get involved in these spiritual battles. Now let's hear from Dr. Walter Martin again on current demonic activity. But something strange happened that night. A young lady was sitting in the service watching me the whole time, didn't take her eyes off me. And then after the service, a gentleman came up and said, there's a girl in the audience, young married lady, who has a problem we'd like to talk to you about. I said, well, I'm rather tired. I'm, my time clock hasn't caught up yet from my flight from the east. Uh, is it very important? Yes, it is somewhat important. What's the problem? Well, she's been dealing with a Christian psychologist for some time. And last night we had a very interesting session with her. There were voices and all kinds of peculiar behavior. And uh, the psychologist has revised some of his opinions. And uh, we think that we've got a case of demon possession on our hands, but we don't know. But you will know. Would you please come and talk with her? I said, all right, I'll talk with her. Well, that began an entire evening that will forever remain memorable. I drove from that church, and the couple drove with me in the car, and two or three other people who had been concerned. This girl, daughter of a missionary, raised in a foreign land, early exposed to demon worship, and then at a point in her life, later find out, to find out, actually a worshiper of Satan, living the Christian life in a Christian church, pretending to be a Christian, the perfect tear in the wheat field. Exactly as the Scripture says. When we got to the parking lot of the motel, suddenly I had an overwhelming sense of evil. And I said to the man driving the car, Stop the car, we've got to pray now. So he jammed on the brakes. <laughs> Didn't have any safety belt. I'm 
that I didn't visit the windshield. And I bowed my head and prayed. I didn't know that the car next to us was the car that this young girl was in. And when I began to pray, she went semi-catatonic. Stiff in the seat, couldn't move. Later she told us that she knew everything that was going on, but she was totally incapable of mobility. And then very strange sounds began to come out of her. <laughs> she didn't want to move out of that seat. I came down out of the car and I walked over and took one look and knew instantaneously what we were dealing with. And I put my hand on her shoulder and I said, They do not want you to leave the car, but if you leave the car, Jesus Christ will set you free. And we took her and lifted her bodily from the car and half walked, half carried her to that motel room. And the moment we got inside the motel room, we had a repetition of the Gospel of Matthew. It took four strong men to hold a five-foot, three-inch girl down on a bed. I know because I was holding one leg and there was a force in her lifting her right off the bed and her whole body was shaking, her face contorted and the noises coming out of her were, well, we might use the word unhealthy. Finally, she relaxed for a moment and began to pray. Well, we started to pray and we were there three hours praying. And while we were praying, we had an interesting conversation with the occupants of her body. It seems they had been there for a long time and they were not about to leave. The psychologist who didn't believe in demon possession when he came in was a thorough convert in five minutes. <laughs> Revolutionized his ministry. The new man. It takes only one encounter with the Holy Spirit and a good shot of the devil and you're in business. You know what's going on. And he knew. To his credit, he knew. And we started to pray. And every time we would invoke the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, as it is recorded here in the book of Acts, I would say, I command you, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out. Hello! The body would jackknife into the air and we'd have to hold her down again. This went on. 20 minutes, 30 minutes. The girl was exhausted. And then, every once in a while, in the middle of the conversation, we'd hear, no, 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 no. And then finally, I'll outlast you. I can outlast you. I won't come out. We won't come out. Sandwich in the dialogue. Those words. Enough to frighten anybody. I'm glad we had witnesses. So everybody knows what was said. Finally, after two and a half hours of praying on our knees, she sat up and said, Oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> she said, uh, uh, I'm ready to go home now. And she smiled and she was her old self and she started to get off the bed and the psychologist <laughs> grabbed her and he said, You are not going anywhere. And the other fellow on the other side grabbed her and the two of us grabbed her legs and the moment we grabbed her. The whole thing began all over again. Now, this is how clever are the forces of darkness. I'm fine. I feel good. I want to go home. Buzz off. Leave me alone. But the moment you can't be fooled anymore, right back again, just like a light switch, to the same behavior pattern all over again. So finally, we were praying for her and we asked her to call on the name of the Lord Jesus. If you could see that girl's body on that bed, her vocal cords, trying to get the name Jesus through her lips. It was incredible. Just trying to say the name Jesus. And I kept saying to her, you have to call on him. Now, we've prayed and we've prayed and we've prayed. You call on the Master. And finally, through this almost clenched lips, Lord Jesus Set me free. Oh. And she fell back on the bed. A minute later, I said to her, pray to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask forgiveness for praying to the devil. She said, I can't. I can't. I said, try. 
slowly for another half hour. Prayer. 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 Finally, her prayer to Christ for forgiveness. And then the third stage. Renounce Satan and everything he stands for. Now, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This time, there wasn't any hesitation. I renounce you in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then she was free. She was really free. She got off that bed and she said, they're gone. They're gone. She grabbed her husband and hugged him. The first time in 20 years, she was free. And then she turned around and did she open our eyes? Her own mother was possessed. Some of her friends were possessed, and she knew who they were. One of them now, beginning to feel the impact of prayer. She said, they've been there all my life almost. She said, I was so frightened of them because they said they'd kill me if I ever told. She said, I couldn't move in the car tonight, Dr. Martin. I couldn't move my hands. I couldn't turn. I couldn't get off that seat. She said... When you put your hand on my shoulder, she said, I, I wanted to turn, I wanted to move, I wanted to get out, I wanted to walk into that room. I knew I could be free. Couldn't. They wouldn't let me. They wouldn't let me talk. They tied my throat and my tongue, my whole body. I couldn't move. She said, and when I got into the room, then I knew. She said, and that's when it all started. But Jesus Christ has set me free. Now, we followed that girl for almost a week now. Her husband reports, brand new girl. Brand new home, brand new mother, brand new Sunday school teacher. Hallelujah. Now, you don't have to go to Africa to find the doctrine of the demons, and you don't have to go to Africa to find the demons. Africa, South America, the dark continents of the world, none are darker than America. For where men have turned from the living God, they have opened themselves to the doctrine of the demons. And within them, the powers of darkness move. Therefore, let us learn from this. These forces are here and they are real. Should you care to doubt me on it, I'd be happy to introduce you to a consulting psychologist who's a new convert to this. <laughs> and to four other people and to a brand new lady who, when she wants to, will give her own testimony, but has not prohibited me from mentioning the case. That is the case, and I could spend the evening giving you more and more and more. But as I said this morning, Satan is alive and well and living on planet Earth. The following is a clip from our video series called Blasphemous, Charismatic, and Pentecostal Mayhem. This is from show number four, where I appear with Rob Zins from Dallas Theological Seminary. Well, anyway, let me read you some of this stuff from Kurt Koch, finally, from, uh, on Walter Martin's recommendation. Right here on page 27, as you can see it on your screen, the Holy Spirit and alien spirits. The late Friedrich Heitmuller, the head of the Holstein Wall Congregation in Hamburg, apparently this is in Germany, uh, coined the term hybrid spirits. This expression can be taken in two ways, one wrong and the other right. It would be wrong to suppose that the Holy Spirit could dwell together with demonic spirits in a man. That is impossible. And Heitmuller did not mean it that way. This expression means rather that alien spirits frequently from the very lowest depths give themselves out to be the Holy Spirit. Here we encounter once more the words of scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, and you quoted it earlier. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, end quote. There are classic examples how unholy spirits can turn up in biblical disguise and lead men astray. I will mention a few. Among those whose language is German, the books of Jacob Lawyer, 1800 to 1864, has spread much confusion. Lorber, a native of Austria, 
was not only a mystic, but also a spiritist medium. He wrote the so-called Great Gospel of John and the Son of the Spirit. In my pastoral work, I have become familiar with the devastating effects of this devout spiritualist. In the English-speaking world, the best known of these hybrid spirits is probably Harry Edwards. He, too, is a spiritualist medium. He wrote the book Spiritual Healing. Edwards speaks of heavenly gods, his angels, without whom he could do nothing. What is seductive about him is the way he cloaks his demonic effects in a robe of Christian piety so that even many Christians and Anglican clergy go to him for advice and assistance. In America, Edward Casey deserves mention. In his theories, he resembles Jacob Lorber. Like Lorber, for example, he espouses reincarnation and asserts, like Lorber, that his powers and spiritual insights are of divine origin. As mentioned before in the previous clip you heard from our Blasphemous, Charismatic, and Pentecostal Mayhem series, number four, about demonic activity going on inside the so-called Christian church. Well, Walter Martin loves the author, Kurt Koch, when it comes to expertise on the occult. And Kurt Koch wrote another book called Occult ABC. And in this book, on page 49, we read... Starting from point two near the bottom of the page, it says, The reactions of mentally ill persons and those who are demon-possessed are different. I will not repeat here what I have already publicized in other books. In my book, Demonology Past and Present, page 136, I have listed eight symptoms of possession. Here I mention only three of the chief ones. A. Attacks of madness which occur only when spiritual counsel is offered. Several Christian workers can testify to such incidents. I was called in to see a woman who began to rave every time someone prayed with her. The same thing happened when I did so. In such cases, it is my practice to command the Spirit in the name of Jesus. B. The trance. If one tries to pray with people who have come under an evil influence, as a result of spiritism, they go straight into a trance. Now looking here on page 50, we see at the top of the page, example 47, a minister in Zurich brought a woman to me for counseling. When I prayed with her, she went into a trance and stuck her tongue out at me. When I said, Amen, she came to herself. I asked her whether she had been to any spiritist seances. She said she had. She had belonged to a spiritist group for the past nine years. C. Speaking in unknown languages. In the Ritual Romanum, speaking in an unknown language is also regarded as a sign of possession. One day a young man came to me for counseling. While we were praying, he went into a trance, and the voices which came from him used foreign languages which he had not learned. This is the strongest argument against the view of the psychiatrist. A person who is mentally ill does not suddenly speak foreign languages which he has not learned. Now, as we get ready to go to some actual video clips of people in so-called charismatic and Pentecostal churches, and then to see what happens in Hindu services and also voodoo witch doctor services, we see an uncanny resemblance of the same kind of phenomenon. Now, right before we look at these, I want you to notice here on the screen this pamphlet that we have where we compare 11 groups with biblical Christianity. It's entitled Christianity, Cults, and the Occult. And in here you can see that this pamphlet covers Christianity, Freemasonry, Kabbalah Center, Wicca, Satanism, Spiritualism, Santeria, Voodoo, Theosophy, Rosicrucianism, Astrology, and Horoscopes, and more. So the reason I'm showing you this, and this is available if you contact our ministry, free of charge. We're not in this for the, the money at all. We're just trying to help people understand what the Bible says about these, these things. But anyway, the uncanny similarity 
in demonic activity between all these groups, for instance, listed here, and what's supposed to be Christianity, such as these Pentecostal and charismatic groups claim to be, is what I would say is nothing more than pure demonic activity going on. Whether you're in voodoo, Hinduism, or so-called Pentecostal or charismatic Christianity, the results are the same. Now we're beginning this collage of video clips from ritualistic meetings. In this case, we're seeing Hindu ritualistic meetings. And here you see in these clips from Hindu services out of India, the same kind of phenomenon that you see will prove later in this collage of videos that these Hindu rituals are very similar to what we see in modern charismatic and Pentecostal activity in the United States and elsewhere in the world. Demonic activity obviously is taking place in these primitive and animistic religions or in this case Hinduism. And of course nobody from a Christian perspective would say that these Hindu rituals and the phenomenon associated with them are of the Holy Spirit or are biblical in any sense of the word. Yet we see the phenomenon here being very similar to what we see in charismatic and Pentecostal circles. You've got the guru putting his hand on people's heads and suddenly they're infused with some kind of spirit that is supposedly overwhelming them with love or whatever it might be that possesses them. Well, I think it starts to become obvious that in some cases, if you were to just play some of this stuff for people, they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a Hindu service, a charismatic service, or as the last clip in this collage of videos will show, voodoo witch doctor, ritualistic occurrences and phenomenon, people rolling around on the ground and so forth, losing possession of their own body. But anyway, hopefully this proves the point on this situation. You need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. And wait till they come to Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Don't leave us to ourselves. Don't leave us to yes. our foolish thinking. Lord, we want all that you have, all, yes. all that you have. Yes. And Lord, if it blows our little minds, let them be blown. <laughs> Father, we want all of what you have, all of what you have. We thank you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lord just reminded me of the old hymn where he leads I will follow. And he had a God told me to look him and I looked at him and he had a tie on and on i don't know if he's here tonight but he'll know on the tie had a wolf howling at the moon and the lord said to me will you howl for me i said don't ask me to do that lord he said if i ask you will you do it he said if i can't ask you to do something in your own house how are you going to do it out there so
After hearing from Kevin Swanson and Walter Martin, I'd like to take a moment here to mention my own encounter with a demon-possessed person at a group Bible study. You can find my full description of it on my video posted on YouTube called Demonic Possession Case, Dealing with the Devil, What Jesus Has Done to Satan. It was quite amazing and is something I am thankful I do not have to deal with on a daily basis. Recently, a good Christian friend and brother of mine who was there the night of the demon possession event happened to email me about another subject he wanted biblical information on. He had moved from Austin over 20 years ago, but still kept in contact with me through the internet. I took the opportunity to ask him if he could write a short one paragraph description of that night so I could include it in this haunted house video. His response was as follows. These are coming from his email. With regard to the paragraph you want me to write, I need to pray about it. That experience was quite traumatic to me, and I rarely think about it. When it comes to the realm of darkness, I do not tread lightly upon it. If God directs me, I will send you something. But I appreciate you thinking about me for this. And then he sent me another email a couple of days later or so. And here's what he said. With regard to the demonic incident, I have prayed about it, and I realize that I have such little remembrance of it that I am not sure what is true or not. I do not want to provide false information, especially in this area. So I think it best not to contribute to it. You were there and probably were more aware of things than I was. Jackson did not elaborate too much about it afterwards, probably because he was trying to protect the woman's reputation. I always wonder if she ever got saved and was released from that horrible condition. What you are about to see is an interview I did with one of our longtime members of my church here in Austin, Texas, who also knew the demon-possessed person that I and my friend dealt with in this aforementioned video. David Harrell, in the following interview, gives some of his own experiences in dealing with this very same demon-possessed person. Possession. Yeah, I've got a video that's well seen on YouTube that deals with my own experience with the woman you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, you weren't there that night. No. It was at a Bible study. Yeah. But she, as you said, she was a member of the church. Mm -hmm. but. And in fact, you have well, described was, to me at church one day the horrific background of what led to this situation. And then I told you, I don't want that to be on our video, right. but well, it was pretty was, terrible. I mean, I couldn't believe it. was sent to the church to try to destroy it. Yeah, yeah. That was, that was the goal. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, this is the first time I'd heard anything about that. I knew who he was talking about, but I didn't know anything about, about the background. But he said, I need somebody to take my place while I'm gone. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I'm willing to do it. I said, but, but uh, I want to start now mm -hmm. working with you because I don't want to go in there you know, not knowing anything and be dealing with this. So I started that very, I guess the next week maybe, uh, with him meeting in a, the person, the woman we were, we, we had a, she had a woman counselor and this woman counselor was a, a psychologist, but she met under, her office was in the offices of a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. And so she would meet, meet with her, and then we, they would meet together, then we would come in, and that's when all the demons would, would manifest, and that's when we would start dealing with them. Yeah. Okay. Now, when you talk about uh, demonic manifestations, what are we talking about here for viewers that don't know any of this stuff? It's almost impossible to describe, but you're talking one minute to a person that you know, a person that you care about, that you love, and uh, the next minute you're talking, she's talking to you, the face changes, the eyes change, the voice changes, and they come at you trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. Choking, kicking, biting, gouging. What about the voices? Do you hear any voices coming out of her mouth? Oh, yeah. I mean, her voice completely changed. There would be male voices, there would be female voices, there would be little child voices. Was there any cursing or anything like that? <laughs> Threats? Oh, yeah, that's all there was. Yes, it, it wasn't too kind of... Now, you cursing, mentioned to me in a previous conversation that Jackson would say something like, I'll summon the smiters. Is that right? Well, 
Jackson was far more knowledgeable than I was, and some of the stuff he got, I don't know. Let me say here, I think it's important to the public to understand the work of the Holy Spirit, because mm -hmm. most, even Christians today, don't understand the depth of the work of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Jackson was given phone numbers. Mm -hmm. Jackson was given and I was too. I mean, I, I didn't get phone numbers, but I was given the names. I was given, uh, we were dealing with one demon one time, had him down on the floor, and we were wrestling around and trying to hold her down and trying to address this demon. And, and I just shouted out, Ola Mathetes, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And he came out like that. Mm -hmm. But you had to get the name right. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> and so the next day, Jake Jackson calls me up and he says, where in the world did you get that name, Ola Mathetes? And he said, mm -hmm. It's Greek. And I said, I don't know. It just popped out of my mouth, you know. And he said, I looked all over the New Testament, the Greek New Testament. I can't find that word. Well, what mm -hmm. it means in Greek is total disciple. Mm -hmm. You know, it means whole disciple or something. So this, mm -hmm. this personality of the, this woman, we should say probably here, I don't know if you've talked about her multiple personality. She was a multiple. Yeah. Uh, we can talk about that if you want, but... But this particular personality had this particular demon, and the Lord gave me a name. So you're saying this woman was uh, possessed by multiple demons? Oh, yeah. It's sort of like what Jesus encountered with Legion yeah. in, the, in the Gospels. Oh, yeah. She had multiple personalities. There were adult female personalities. So what you're saying is when you said that one name, that Greek name, yeah. that, that particular demon was exercised right on the spot. He left right then. And that but that still meant the other ones were there. Oh yeah, the other ones did. You, we had to go through and had to address them name by name, personality by personality. And, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, we did, I was with it for two years, and then I, my company sent me out to Phoenix uh, mm -hmm. every week, and, and I couldn't do it anymore. But uh, Along these lines, I want to also mention some items from a great little track that I've always liked and used for decades all the decades I've been a Christian anyway. It's uh, put out by the Book Fellowship International. Anyway, I've always just loved this little thing. It talks about spiritualism, sorcery, and witchcraft. It has questions. Number one, do you know that God commanded Israel that those who practice sorcery or witchcraft would not be permitted to live? Exodus chapter 22 verse 18 says, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Do you know that to seek to communicate with spirits or with the dead is to become defiled and unfit to appear before God to worship him? Leviticus 19 verse 31 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Do you know that God cuts off from among his people all who turn to mediums for help? Leviticus chapter 20, verse 6. And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Do you know that capital punishment by stoning was God's sentence for any man or woman who calls up spirits? Leviticus chapter 20, verse 27. A man also, or a woman, that hath a familiar spirit, or that is a wizard, shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Question 5. Do you know that witchcraft, fortune-telling, crystal reading, necromancy, and palmistry are related to spiritism and are strongly condemned by God? Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 10 and 11. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. Question 6. Do you know that it was because of their black magic and related practices that God destroyed the Canaanites? As the viewers at home can see there, Deuteronomy chapter 18, 10 and through 12 repeats what I've already read before. There shall not be found among you 
anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God, that drive them out from before thee. Question 7. Do you know that Samuel's most effective way of impressing upon Saul the enormity of the sin of disobedience was by liking it to witchcraft? 1 Samuel 15, verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. 8. Do you know that King Saul of Israel, when he was faithful to God, cleared all the spiritualistic mediums out of the land? That's 1 Samuel chapter 28, verse 3. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. And Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. 9. Do you know that when King Saul later consulted a medium, it was only after his sins had made communication with God impossible? 1 Samuel chapter 28, verses 6 and 7. And when Saul inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets, then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at Endor. Question 10. Do you know that Saul's loss of his crown and his untimely death were the direct judgment of God on him for his dealings in spiritism? 1 Chronicles chapter 10 verse 13 says, So Saul died for his transgression which he committed against the Lord, even against the word of the Lord, which he kept not, and also for asking counsel of one that had a familiar spirit to inquire of it. Question 11. Do you know that the list of wicked King Manasseh's sins, including consulting with spirit mediums, fortune tellers, and sorcerers? Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse 6. And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Question 12. Do you know that one of the reasons God rejected Israel was because they practiced magic and communicated with evil spirits. Isaiah chapter 2 verse 6. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, and are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. Question 13. Do you know that it is insulting to God to consult the dead when you can inquire of God himself? As it says here, of him. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 19. And when they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and that mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God for the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony? If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Question 14. Did you know that a fortune teller may be demon-possessed like the girl in Philippi, out of whom Paul cast an unclean spirit in the name of Jesus? Acts chapter 16, starting in verse 16 through 18. And it came to pass, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us, 
and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. Verse 18. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. Question 15. Do you know that true Christians, like those of Ephesus, have nothing to do with black magic and its related practices? Acts 19.19 19. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver. Question 16. Did you know that sorcery is included in the works of the flesh listed in the Bible and that those who practice it cannot enter the kingdom of God? Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Question 17. Do you know that those who engage in sorcery will be shut out of heaven and banished forever from God. Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, and Revelation chapter 22, verse 15. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Also in Revelation chapter 22, verse 15, it says, For without are dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and whosoever loveth and maketh a lie. Question 18. Do you know that the teachings of Spiritism are doctrines of demons? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Question 19. Do you know that demons are subject to God's greater power and tremble before him? James chapter 2, verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. And finally, question 20. Do you know that the increase in following after subversive doctrines inspired by devils is one of the predicted signs of the last days and the near approach of judgment? 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. That's adapted from the British evangelist. Anyway, I've always loved that track. It really helps you understand the magnitude of what we're dealing with when we're dealing with doctrines of devils, satanic entities, witchcraft, sorcery, haunted houses, ghosts, poltergeists, spirits, fortune tellers, and all the rest. The whole world of the occult is a curse on any who engage in it. Once again, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. Anyway, this is a great little succinct tract dealing with these issues that really get the point across, particularly if people just read the Bible verses that are listed in it. They'll find out how obvious it is that, that these things are of the devil from the Word of God. So with that in mind, to get a free copy of this and other literature and information, our newsletters I've already referenced to, Christian Answers on ghosts and things of that nature all these things are free no charge to you all you really have to do is email us at cdebater at aol.com listing your mailing address there and then once we have it 
you will be sent these materials free of charge, no cost, and you'll have all this reference material at your disposal. Now, keep in mind that we don't have a lot of paid staff or secretaries or workers or anything like that. So if you send in a request, just be ready for it to take a while to get back to you. But we will get it back to you at some point in time, just not right away. We just don't have a ministry set up for that. We're just small and do what we can for the Lord and what the Lord has given us. But uh, tracks like this and other information, our newsletters are readily available for you. Just uh, email us at cdebater at aol.com. And we'll be more than happy to send that to you. On one final thought on this, the section with, the, uh, with our little tract that we're offering, I want our readers and listeners and those watching this video to understand something very important here in what Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 22. Jesus is giving this story, and he says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels unto Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23, And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receiveth thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one sent unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. Now notice this passage coming from the lips of Jesus. He's stressing the importance of Moses and the prophets and much of what was just given in that little tract that we reviewed is from Leviticus, Deuteronomy. That's Moses. And Jesus is referencing to that. That means that Jesus is saying, you better listen to Moses and the prophets, the word of God, because if you don't believe that stuff, you're not going to believe a spirit coming back from the dead. And we just have in this reference here that the spirits can't get from the, between the, the great gulf fix. So someone that's dead, they, they're not getting out of there until judgment day. That means if you're in a seance speaking to supposed dead relatives, you're not talking to them because they can't get out of this place where the rich man is. They're stuck there until judgment day, Revelation chapter 20. So who are they talking to? when they're in seances, and, and these people with familiar spirits. Well, they're talking to the demonic entities. That's why the scripture makes it so clear not to be involved with those things, because you're dealing with the devil. Just simply look at Revelation chapter 12, starting in verse 11. And it says there, And they overcame him, now they're talking about the devil, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. So that's the saints of God, those that believe in Jesus. They overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb, and so forth, as you have there in that verse. Then as you read on, what does it say? It says, Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, 
that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. You see right there a spiritual war in symbolic terminology going on here where the devil is trying to fight against the spiritual reality of Christ and his church. And then in verse 17, what do we see? And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So here in Revelation chapter 12, you have it all just laid out for you in unmistakable terminology. The devil's here on the earth. He's not in heaven anymore. He's been cast out. So where is he? He's not in the lake of fire yet. That's yet in the future. So where is the devil and all his demons? They're right here on the planet with us, the humans. So <laughs> to not believe he's around or can interact, being a fourth dimensional being, he can interact with the third dimension where we are. And here's your proof from the Bible right here. Just wanted to make that point so nobody could miss it. The other thing that was interesting that I thought that was kind of fantastic, but maybe not so much supernatural, but just maybe a, a phenomenon in, in nature. But didn't you say one time in that house you were in your mother's bedroom walking out in a no, lightning bolt? No, I was in the kitchen. Oh, the, you were in the kitchen. Okay. And I was going to go to the bathroom. Okay. And right before I got to the bathroom, uh, there was a thunderstorm going on, and a lightning okay. bolt came straight across the, through the screen door and uh, right through the bathroom and hit the sink. Now, and knocked the piece of the porcelain off the sink. Right before you walked into it. Yeah, you almost yeah. walked right into a lightning bolt. That's right, because it was just a big flash. <laughs> It went right by as you're about to go yeah, right there. hair just went all the way up. Because <laughs> that's what electrical deal do. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 An electrical charge. It, now, when that happened, because I know where the kitchen is in that old house, and the, that hallway leading to that bathroom we're going, but are you saying that that lightning bolt came through the screen door on the balcony of yeah, that on, bedroom? On the, yeah, on the and front. it went down the hallway. Yeah. Okay. Straight, yeah, that's why I thought it was straight like, through the bedroom, through exactly. the little hall. And, that's right. That's and right. Hit, hit the, that's why I thought it was. You know, that's exactly where I mean, it came it from. I didn't know you were coming from the other. There wasn't any imagination because there was no chip in the sink until that hit. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that chip. That's, that's right. right. It was right. That was a lightning bolt chip. So, yeah, yeah. so, so anyway, this this is pretty uh, phenomenal stuff, and I wanted to. You know, I had some people that really wanted to hear this story, and, but I, and I thought I had related it but somewhere, but to, it dawned on me while we we're meeting here for my dad's 84th birthday <laughs> that we, we should get this on tape to share with everybody. And of course, I'll be adding in uh, other scriptural references and things, and maybe we can find that clip of Grandma's old book, Ancient Egyptian Secrets. Uh, I, I'll, I'll, play, I'll clip this in here with that. But... Uh, any other, I know mom got into some of this stuff. She, well, she had that book, you know, I, I got the book after my mother died. Yeah. But I never, I read a little bit of it and I said, boy, this is a bunch of BS. Yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And so she got a hold of the book, you know, my, your mother wasn't right sometimes. Mm -hmm. And so she got into it and started putting stuff all over the walls in the house. And she used to give me these little spell papers to yeah. keep on my, yeah, it was like a protection. Yeah, well, that protection letter came from my mother and I, her side of the family. Okay, kind of protect me from whatever. Well, from being shot by a gun. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I never, it was all these weird symbols and everything, and I would look at that, but I'd carry it on me just because... Mom yeah. asked me to. You yeah, know. that's what I did too. To, I don't want to do it anymore. That I know. Yeah, I'm, yeah, yeah. I didn't know what the heck. You know, I was just the kid growing but, up, and uh, <laughs> it wasn't. So. It wasn't good for the dog's health because they said if you didn't believe in this letter, 
to put it on a dog and then take a rifle and try to shoot the dog. And, oh. and, oh. Wow. And, Sound like classic occultism. Yeah. Spell, spell, spell stuff. Which well, she says, you know, during World War One, that one of her dad's friends or something had that letter with him and some German pulled a pistol on him and was going to shoot him and the pistol wouldn't fire. Oh. And that's why she thought it was legitimate. Oh, okay. Because I remember Grandpa being in World War I. My own grandfather, my dad's dad, was a veteran in World War I in the U.S. military. And another thing about that old house is there's World War I gear. Grandpa's old helmet and he had those World War I bullets and the gas mask. Mm -hmm. that you said he put that out in front of the house and it kind of disintegrated. Well, yeah, yeah, I hung it up during World War II so that it'd be hanging in a tree out there so that soldiers that passed by would see that he... Yeah, yeah he served in the military. Yeah. Uh, well, he was in the Veterans of Foreign War. Uh, well, he went over to France, but he never got up to the front line because he got that... Spanish flu that time. Oh, okay. He was in a hospital in Paris for three months before he finally got out of there. He said some French doctor saved his life because oh, he, okay. he was in bad shape. Yeah, yeah if uh, he, that French doctor hadn't done that, none of us would be here. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I, I thought he also guarded some German prisoners outside well, yeah, of Paris. Yeah, up in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas. Oh, okay, because he... Uh, he could speak three languages, right? German, Czech, and... No, it, well, he a little Czech, but he spoke German fluently and English. Oh, okay, because I know he, in World he, War II, you were starting to pick up German, and they told you to stop because we're having a... World War II, we're having a war with Germany. No, so, I don't think that was the case. They oh, really? No, they just... They were speaking... German when they wanted to speak adult stuff, you know, and oh, so they, and, so you wouldn't find out what they're talking about. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> but after about when I was about six years old, uh, sometimes I know what they were talking about, and finally I told them. I said, I know what you're saying, <laughs> and then they quit talking no more German. <laughs> so that's why I lost my German. Oh, uh, I got you. So, just for historical purposes, I put in this picture from 1959 of my grandfather, who was the World War I veteran, Leon Wessels, here with me, sitting on a swing there hanging from a pecan tree in the front yard of that house in Schulenburg. So I can honestly say that my grandfather served in World War I. Now here, Grandpa Wessels, this is 1959, he passed away in 1970 with military honors. Uh, now, one last thing before we conclude here. Uh, I remember, I don't know, it must have been 30 years ago now, but it seemed like you mentioned to me uh, because mom was getting into some of this this witchcraft type stuff and the spells and all that, uh, that maybe once or twice you saw something kind of strange in our house in Houston. Did you? Well, that was me, not her. Right, but you saw something that... Well, one, kind of... night, one, one night I woke up in the middle of the night and, of course, she... I was laying in the bed on the other side of me there, and mm -hmm. and I opened my eyes, and it looked like I saw, you know, the scepter of death over, you know, the... Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. This kind of a ap aspirational, ap whatever you call it. Apparition. Apparition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was it. Oh, okay. So that was that one time you thought yeah. you saw something there as you just opened your eyes yeah. over mom. Was that... Was that around 1985 when she passed away, or do you no, know? That was, that was over 30 years ago. Yeah, that so, was before that a little bit. Okay, because... Not too much before that. I, You know what's weird is... Probably about 1980, 19... Okay, because uh, uh, the last, one of the last times I saw Mom, I was in for a... a I was just visiting, and uh, it was my last day or something like that, and who was her favorite aunt? I forgot her name now. Uh, she had an aunt... And her uncle Frank, her you remember Fred, Uncle Fred and Millie. Was it Aunt Millie? Or? Yeah, Aunt Millie was uh, my mother's sister. Okay, so I remember they yeah, were. I had, I had a bunch of aunts and uncles from my dad's side, but none of them were very close. Okay, well I I know that Aunt Millie. I guess her, her name and uh, her husband Frank. I remember Fred, his name, Fred. Fred. Fred it oh, was, was it Fred? 
Yeah. Okay, well, I don't remember his name after all. It started with an F, though, so I was at least that close. Okay, so the three of them are in the front living room at the old house in Houston. And uh, I'm sitting there trying to tell them about the Bible, telling them about Jesus, trying to preach to them. No uh, because way. I felt something was weird in the house. You know, no, when, no, wait a minute. Nothing like that because they were long dead by then. No, this was 1985. Yeah, I know. This is, we used to go visit those people. Yeah. I can't remember their names now. Okay. Uh, you, and they both had... And they're not my aunt and stuff then. I don't no. know. That's Aunt Tilly, right? Was it Aunt Tilly? Oh, well, you're talking about um, my, my... Not on my, your side, but on... My, my, your mother's side. Right, right. It was okay, her aunt. yeah. I was thinking you're talking about my no, side. No, no. So, aunt, yeah, was aunt, it Aunt Tilly? Yeah, Aunt Tilly. And yeah. her husband, Frank. Yeah, right? Frank. Yeah, there you go. That's what I was trying to get at because there's the three of them sitting in the front living room and I had an opportunity to preach the gospel to them. And so I started to preach and teach them about what the Bible says about Jesus. And the more I preached and gave them the biblical references, the madder they got. <laughs> and uh, the more... Man, you should have seen the looks on their faces. They were not enjoying the Bible stuff I was telling them as I was sitting in the front living room. You were at work at the yeah, time. So, and I was just there sitting with them talking before I was getting ready to leave to go back to Austin. So anyway, what's so weird to me is uh, within, within four months or so of that time, that was 1985, Yeah, all three of them were dead. Mm -hmm. Mom died, I think, in this uh, a few months later during the summer, and then the other two had died shortly before, shortly after I'd been there that day. Mm -hmm. So I always remember that particular case, just because as I'm preaching to them, they're getting so mad and hostile, yeah. and then it was just weird to me that within a few months, all three of them were gone, wow. and that was just kind of it, it just kind of stuck with me all these years. Some final thoughts about my mom. Here's a newspaper article showing my mother when she got married back in 1956. Here's a photo of my mother and me around the year 1958. Here's a shot of my mom around Christmas 1984 with her granddaughter and my daughter Marlena. Even though as far as I know my mom attended church on and off throughout her life and made me go when I was a kid she never seemed to have a good and solid understanding of what the Bible actually taught and thus was easily deceived by the witchcraft book she used simply because it employed some Bible terminology. The one thing I'll always remember is when I got born again in 1981 and my mother came to visit not long after that, I told her, Mom, you must be born again. As Jesus said in John chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. And all my mom said to that in response was, what? How can someone enter a second time into their mother's womb? Of course, I was shocked. I then told her, you just repeated what Nicodemus said in John chapter 3, verse 4. And then I quoted her John 3, 5 through 8. Now let's take a look at this. We, look, we start in verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, that's Jesus, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not, that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. I want to thank you all for uh, relating this uh, to my audience. Uh, I think it was meant to be this way.
because I could have sworn I had put it, but people already saw from my recollection of things. <laughs> it's not as great. It's kind of it's hard to remember 40 years ago, 50 years ago. You know? all, right, all three of us are getting kind of old now, so uh, I figure we better do this while we're all still here. Uh, so anyway, thanks, Dad, for helping us out with this okay. uh, little exposition. Gary, as usual. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining us here for this discussion. Um, what uh, my brother has aptly called a spook house. <laughs> God bless you all. Keep your trust in Jesus Christ and you have no worries about spooks or anything else. Eternal salvation is through Jesus. John 14, 6. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. God bless you all. See you next time. Bye-bye. I wanted to interject here to our viewers that we have on our YouTube channel, C Answers TV, which stands for Christian Answers Television. A six-hour in-depth video study with Dr. Thomas Ice, co-author of the book, and you can see it there on your screen, Overrun by Demons. It says there on the cover, The Church's New Preoccupation with the Demonic. Now, you can get too carried away with the things of the devil. As you can see on the back of this book, Overrun by Demons, by Dr. Ice and also Robert Dean, their pictures are at the bottom of this page that you're looking at right now. And I'll just read the description of this excellent book. It used to be called A Holy Rebellion, but it was renamed by Harvest House Publishers to this new title to basically deal with all the heresies that go on in so-called Christian circles when they make too much of the devil and take it to an extreme. We just need a balanced biblical approach when it comes to dealing with the demonic, the occult, and so forth. The description to this book says, Despite the many resources Christians can use in the battle against the kingdom of darkness, more people than ever are returning from spiritual warfare, bloodied and wounded. How can that be when God's word repeatedly assures us of victory? Tragically, much of what is taught today about spiritual warfare deals with only one issue, the devil. In contrast, the Bible says we have three enemies. Not only must we defend ourselves against Satan, but against the world and the flesh as well. Only a truly biblical and balanced approach to spiritual warfare will work. Overrun by demons provides that desperately needed view, asking, can demons make you sin? Can Christians be demon-possessed? Which strategies are correct for battling Satan, the flesh, or the world Overrun by Demons will give you a biblical strategy for spiritual warfare that offers you lasting protection and victory on the spiritual battlefield. Now with that said, just go to YouTube and you can find this by going to the YouTube search box. The titles of these shows, here they are. You can also put my name, Larry Wessels, Spiritual Warfare, and these six hours of video information with Dr. Thomas Ice will be of most help to those that really want to study into these issues in a balanced way. First, we have in this six-part series, Biblical Worldview of Spiritual Warfare, number one. Three vicious foes, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Part two of Biblical Worldview of Spiritual Warfare, Holy Spirit-given Word of God, the Bible, defeats the devil. Part three, Satan's Devices counterfeit miracles to teleportation part four in this video series the names and attributes of satan the prince of darkness part five satanic techniques and false demon fighting heresies this particularly will help the christian not fall into all the common traps that many of these charismatic and pentecostal type churches fall into when it comes to demon fighting in dealing with the demonic. And finally, part six, sins of the flesh versus demon possession and demonology. One last thing I'd like to offer to viewers of this video that made it this far into the video and are actually seeing this is a free book they can get uh, from our ministry. Just contact our ministry. You can email us at cdebater at aol.com and I'll be glad to send you this book free of charge 
send your mailing address in your email. It's called Ultimate Questions by Christian author John Blanchard. And it answers a lot of ultimate questions you might have about God. Does he exist? What is he like? Can I know him and experience his power in my life? And if so, how? This book tackles these vital questions head on and answers them simply, clearly, and directly. Read it carefully. It could change your life forever. And finally, I want to thank my daughter, Marlena Wessels Gothier, for doing the video work in our camp house scene with my dad, my brother, and myself. Oh, and by the way, for those interested, Marlena has a music CD out. This is her second CD album called God Created. And this is also free to anyone who wants to email us at cdebater at aol.com to get a free copy of that CD. I think you'll be blessed by it. If you like our YouTube channel, please subscribe by clicking on the subscribe button and then by also clicking the bell above to get an automatic update whenever we produce another YouTube video for our See Answers TV channel. Please share our videos with your friends and relatives. May God bless you. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what is done for Christ will last. See related videos by tapping or clicking screens.